The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. All right, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome back to DIS2. We're going to look at post desktop window systems today. So, we're going to move beyond the uh, window systems we've seen so far, which were mostly um, you know, driving desktops, and are going to take a look at what happens beyond that. Uh, and of course, everybody thinks of the smartphone uh, when you consider post desktop user interfaces, but there's a lot of other stuff, right? There's smartwatches, there's tablets, uh, you got cars with user interfaces, you got TVs. These are all examples, if you think about it, of, of you know, all these things can run apps, but they don't have a, a classic WIMP GUI, right? window, icons, menus, pointers. It doesn't work that same way. So, um, Obviously, a bunch of things has, has to change. Um, and we'll see, from a technical point of view, what changes and what actually sort of stays the same in this setting. Um, so we're going to begin uh, with mobile devices, so smartphones and, and similar stuff. Um, now, our examples um, are often going to refer to the iPhone, since that's the platform we know really well. But a lot of that applies to Android as well. And we will be covering both iOS and Android today. So we're going to look at those two platform since they uh, basically share the market between, between them. Um, <coughs> first of all, a couple of things that obviously are different when you work uh, for mobile, right? Um, you got much smaller screens. That's what everybody thinks about immediately. Uh, but you know, that has led to a couple of things that are interesting, that are different from what you see on the desktop. First of all, you usually interact with only one app at a time, right? If you switch to a different app, you, it, it goes full screen and it takes up everything. Yes, there are exceptions when like a notification scrolls in or if you get to tablets like the iPad Pro, then you have like, you know, the ability to split up your screen again in a tiled window manager fashion, kind of like AT style, um, because there's a little bit more space, so two apps next to each other seem to make sense, but beyond that it gets uh, less and less interesting. And then there's a stage manager recently introduced on iOS where you can have like even more applications running, so it, it begins to move back to multiple uh, windows. But especially on the phone, a multi-window environment doesn't make a lot of sense, right? So you interact with one app at a time. Even more so, uh, it's not just one app, it's one screen, too. Right? So you don't have multiple windows of your one app open, usually, um, especially not on a smartphone. Another thing that's tricky, um, if we think back to you know people inventing the GUI, uh, they had a reasonable amount of space on the desktop, and they used it to provide lots of visual cues, online help, you know, nice drag and drop, direct manipulation metaphor. So all of this was designed to be extremely easy to pick up and use, and they used the screen real estate to provide hints, right? Like, for example, the menu bar. The menu bar is really handy because you don't have to remember the commands that you have to do. You just look them up, right? You drop down the menu, so look for the thing you want, you find it, you select it, done. That's really convenient, but it takes up space. And we don't have that space on a mobile platform. So that's a challenge, and you'll find, if you think about most mobile applications, actually have very little on-screen help. And so that puts an extra challenge on you as developers, if you write apps, of course, to make your apps easy to use without requiring extra help and, and uh, documentation. Well, and then there are some more technical constraints, like memory and power are, of course, limited. Um, Limited memory is one of those things that can really nip you in the behind on mobile platforms or smaller devices in general. Because while we all thought, you know, with the advent of Java and garbage collection, so we're never ever going to worry about memory again, right? We just use it and something cleans up behind us and takes care of reclaiming any memory we don't need anymore. And if, if not, uh, who cares? You know, if it eats a couple megabytes an hour running, you know, we just stick in another RAM chip and we're good. Um, and that doesn't work on mobile. So um, I remember many years ago when we first um, started teaching iOS, uh, students were completely shocked because they actually had to do manual memory management again. There was no garbage collection on iOS when it first came out. So you literally had to like, you know, allocate your memory. And ooh, <laughs> that was, a, that was a, an interesting trip uh, into, into the past. Um, limited power also, of course, means that you need to think much more about what you do, right? You, if you take up more memory, um, that often eats into battery life as well, right? Because more stuff gets pushed around, shuffled around, 
Um, and uh, that's a limita limiting factor on mobile. And finally, the, the kind of cool stuff is we got all these new sensors. Like we got cameras, we got gyros in there, you know, inertial management uh, units, IMUs, uh, that can give you all kinds of interesting input. You got lots of other sensors, not just microphones, et cetera. Um, LiDAR maybe even, you know, what, what, what have you. So there's a lot of stuff going on on mobile, not to talk about multi-touch, of course, um, that is different from, from the desktop and that we can make use of. These are all clear, but this is missing one aspect. Um, let's see here, we're, we're, uh, we're a small group, so what do you think from a, from a user point of view? Um, what's fundamentally different between when you use a mobile device to do something like an app on a mobile versus when you're using your, your laptop, for example. I'm not talking about technology so far, but more, you know, the, the use case, the, the environment. Yeah? Yeah, on the go, right? So, so you use it while you're mobile. You're, you're walking around of, often, right? Not, not, not necessarily, right? You might be using a smartphone when you're sitting down, but uh, the context in which you're using it, the physical environment, the physical context that you find yourself in while using an app has a much bigger impact and it's much more varied than for a laptop, right? You don't normally use your laptop while walking across the street, right? I hope. Uh, I mean, I'm talking to computer scientists here, so who knows, but you're, usually you don't, right? So context is key uh, and that means that we need to really take another hard look at, at that factor because that actually has a couple implications. It has implications, first of all, on the focus that people have on your ta on the task they're doing on the device. If you're sitting in front of your laptop, people often like to talk about these things as like sitting forward activities. Right? When you like, you lean in, right? You're, you're concentrated, you're engaged, you're focused on your laptop. Uh, and there's not much that distracts you, right? Sometimes you might even not, not even notice somebody coming into the room. Um, that's a very different mental mode of working uh, of being engaged than using your smartphone, right? While you're waiting for the bus or while you're crossing the street or whatever, right? You whip it out, you do a couple things on there, you put it back. Uh, so this has, this means there are interactions that only last a few seconds, right? You don't have those on a laptop usually. So that means that they need to be extremely fluid, right? You can't have people, you know, do a 15 second login procedure to open up their phone because their whole interaction was supposed to just last you know, five seconds to be like, okay, when's that bus coming? All right, and that kind of stuff. Um, the other thing is that your attention is split between the phone um, and the rest of your environment. Um, if I had to describe one thing that totally differentiates um, thinking about mobile apps for, from thinking about desktop apps is that it's very unlikely to get hit by a bus while you're working on your laptop. Right? That doesn't usually happen. That is not at all unlikely while you're using your smartphone, right? Um, so I think this, this sort of drives home the fact that we have to remember people using smartphones, uh, you as an app developer don't have their full attention, right? You have a split attention because they have to sort of pay attention to the surroundings, hopefully, um, and they're not gonna be you know, quite as engaged and deeply focused. They might be, you know, if it's a really good, you know, I don't know, YouTube pl playlist maybe, or a really good book, they might get sunk in there. Um, but usually uh, there are a lot of interactions that only happen um, very peripherally. Um, this is a video I like to show that, that drives home that point uh, of sort of split attention. This was a security camera recording uh, in a shopping mall. Um, and uh, you can here the uh, team is reviewing that tape now, the, the security team, and is talking about it while they're playing it back. Um, I think we might not actually have um, audio on this one, but uh, you know, you can see what, what happens on this one. Sure enough, there's a lady typing on her phone and there she goes into the fountain, you know, into the water fountain and she just gets up and you know, nonchalantly walks out and continues her, her shopping trip. Um, but that, you know, that's the kind of stuff that happens when people don't pay attention to the surroundings and obviously you don't want that. Um, so I think it drives home the fact that context is, is key. Um, we talk about this factor, like what's special for developing for mobile more 
um, in our iOS class. Right? We have a whole class um, about iOS application development that's taught in uh, winter. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, you know, make some room in your schedule uh, next semester and uh, uh, come to our class. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Today, we're only basically going to be talking about the architectural things and the key um, patterns, basically, right? You know, that we've always been looking for in all these Windows systems in iOS uh, for you know, half of this, this class here today. Uh, so we're squeezing sort of a whole semester of stuff into uh, these next 45 minutes or, or 60 minutes, maybe. Um, so let's look at iOS really quickly. Um, the history of iOS starts in 2007 when the iPhone came out um, and kind of you know, surprised the rest of the mobile phone market. Um, the key change, of course, was, or the key thing that, that was different was this decision to say, we're not going to have any more keyboards on these things. We're just going to use a screen, right? full, full, full screen, multi-touch. Um, that was a radical design decision. Um, and it made some things extremely difficult, right? If you've ever tried typing on your smartphone without looking at the screen for extended periods of time, your fingers will drift off the keyboard, right? Because you don't feel the keys physically, so you're going to mistype things. Um, so typing, you know, got much diff more difficult than on devices that had physical keys. Even if the keys were tiny, people would go very fast on these and actually type sort of eyes free on these. Uh, because you had the haptic sensation of feeling these keys. So that was given up, but of course, what you gain by this is a super flexible UI, right? Imagine a, you know, a Blackberry or any of those devices that used to have keyboard and screen. Um, the space was always divided between these two things, and, and the hard keys that were there were what they were, right? They were labeled the way they were labeled. You couldn't change them. Uh, they were always going to be a full keyboard, even if you only had to type in a phone number. Right? while calling somebody, you don't need all these hardware keys, but they're still there and taking up space, making the screen smaller. On the iPhone or Android phones, any smartphone that has a full touch screen, the UI adapts to the task. Right? So if I need to type in a phone number, the UI becomes this big, friendly numerical keyboard, right? because that's all I need. Makes the buttons bigger, makes it easier and faster to type. We know this from Fitz Law. So it's much more flexible and can adjust to the task, which of course makes a lot of sense. So um, when I was talking about the lean forward and, and, and sort of uh, and, 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 and lean back tasks, right, this is an interesting distinction that I find helpful to, to think about. Um, working on a laptop, writing your thesis, you know, you're engaged, it's a lean forward task. When you are on your smartphone browsing, you know, Facebook or whatever, TikTok, um, you are in a you are in a media consumption phase, right? Um, so you are looking at stuff. You're consuming content largely. Uh, you might even be posting a few you know text messages to your friends or something, um, but it's not where you will write your thesis, right? It's not for heavily engaged, complex content creation. Now. Having said that, that's, it's a good distinction between like lean back tasks, consuming media, and lean forward tasks, you know, creating content. Um, the, the boundaries are blurring, of course. If you've got a large tablet, iPad Pro or something like that from the Windows or Android world, uh, you can start using these for a lot of fairly reasonable uh, content creation tasks too. You know, maybe it's actually even better for sketching something than doing that on a laptop, right? Um, so with large mobile devices, the spam boundary blurs, but generally we can say that's the idea, um, that these devices were largely made for media consumption. Just to drive home how uh, unique this moment was when the iPhone was introduced, I had a, well, you could probably call them dumb phones or like, you know, smartphones trying to be smart before uh, this form factor became available. Um, I think it was a Nokia E61 or something. It was one of those square phones that had a bottom row of keys and a fairly sizable screen for a phone before uh, this form factor. Um, and it had 3G at the time, which was awesome, right? Nobody had that. So I had this thing, and it had what they called a web browser on it, right? And you could basically look at a web page, and then you could use the, the tiny little joystick on this thing to click from 
like you know link to link and then press in when you wanted to select the link that you were seeing Whew. <laughs> I never ever used it for serious web browsing right and I remember the moment when um, when I got an iPhone uh, the iPhone didn't have 3g the, the original iPhone was not a 3g device, so it was significantly slower in terms of its network connectivity right it was edge back at the time you could actually do things on edge back in those days um, but it was slower than 3g so even though it was slower, this was the first time I remember I was in a store looking at a pair of sneakers and I was like, hmm, I wonder how much these are on Amazon, right? So I got out the phone, did that, miraculously had reception inside the store. Um, and even though the network was slower, like the technical performance of the network was, was not what I had on the, this other phone, this was the first time I actually was able to do something useful on the internet on a mobile setting. Right? I never did that with the E61 simply because the usability was so bad. So it's not always, you know, remember that when you think about, ooh, you know, what's the resolution, uh, what's the network connectivity, these technical things are important, but if you get the UI just right, you can actually, you know, overshadow a lot of these things. Uh, in the end, this was the better browsing device, even though it was slower to connect to content on the web. Um, a couple other things were radical with this. Um, I think, uh, the other thing that changed, if you remember phones before this, uh, they were often made by a, a hardware vendor. Then uh, some network provider would you know, try to brand them in some way. And you would end up with phones that were maybe from Nokia, but that had a big, I don't know, pink telecom go and get online button on them or something. And you would press that button, it would immediately charge you like, I don't know, a euro 59 or something per minute. Um, and, and get you, you know, uh, uh, get you some, some data. So it, it was a very inconsistent user experience. And here, just like with the Mac, Apple basically did the same thing. They developed the hardware, they developed the operating system, they wrote the core apps on this thing. Remember that when the iPhone came out, there was no app store. You, as an ordinary mortal, could not write apps for the iPhone for a year or two. Right? That wasn't available. Um, about a year, actually. Uh, but so that was a very different situation. So this vertical integration of all these layers meant, of course, that things could work very smoothly together. Um, so there was, it also really sort of devalued the impact uh, that uh, the network providers could have, right? You know, like telecom, Vodafone, those kinds of places um, had much less to say on, on the iPhone. They weren't happy about this, but it turned out to be a better user experience. Um, so, Next up, I think you know the App Store came in a year later, so people could start writing apps for this thing, uh, which was uh, I've I've heard from from people who who work at Apple that uh, something that took Apple mostly by surprise. Right, the success of the App Store and, and this whole ecosystem of writing apps was a big surprise. Uh, they hadn't expected it to become such a uh, success story, and of course is a major source of income now. Um, the iPad came around in 2010. Um, created this, again, a new device class of, of tablets, you could say, um, that was actually bought by many people without them knowing exactly what they would be using it for. Like you would talk to these people say, huh, I've seen, seen the iPad? And they're like, yeah, I'm gonna get one. So what are you gonna use it for? It's like, oh, don't know exactly, but I want one, right? Uh, partly, of course, this was because the iPhone had left um, you know, a, a positive impression for people. They thought, okay, uh, these guys know how to build usable products, and I'm sure this next thing is also going to be uh, useful. So the iPhone fame sort of uh, rubbed off, you could, could say. Um, beyond this, uh, we have uh, then, of course, uh, an introduction of Siri in, in 2011, which was fairly early in the game, um, but uh, you know, started to introduce simple ways in, to use uh, voice control. Uh, then there was uh, things like the, you know, in 2013 we saw a change towards the flat user interface, right? So the, the, the earlier, more like skeuomorphic, you know, realistic um, user interface design with buttons that looked like buttons uh, went away in favor of a very flat um, design uh, that usability professionals are not a big fan of because it removes lots of cues for the user, what is actually clickable or tappable. Uh, but there you go, you know, fashion. Um, fingerprint sensors came around 2014 sort of the Apple Watch so we have another form factor uh, 
uh, we uh, got to uh, the iPad Pro and, and the pencil uh, being available. You know, up to then, all these devices were used by finger only. This was another deviation from what, what happened done before. If people had been doing touch screens before, small phones, they were always you know, usable with a stylus because they had these resistive touch screens. Um, and uh, so moving to finger touch was another thing that was quite surprising. Um, 2015 also saw a brief introduction of 3D touch, which mean, meant that there was a force sensing uh, of the touch. So you could touch lightly or more uh, firmly, and that was detected as a, another mo modality of input, um, which from an HDI perspective I thought was amazing. We did a whole bunch of research projects that used that touch technology to build new interfaces that used it. Uh, unfortunately, a couple of years later it was removed again. Um, so now you have to kind of long press to mimic the effects of a, of a force touch, of a 3D touch on, on the platform, which is not great because it's a time-based user interface and you know how I love time-based user interfaces. Um, then you know, ARKit came around, of course, augmented reality, uh, iPad OS as a split off of the platform. So this is where we see that increasingly the iPad was, was, was moving away from being just a mobile device like a big iPhone and becoming its own sort of you know, device class and had more and more features that weren't making sense on an iPhone like the split screen thing. Um, and so ultimately it was split off in its own, into its own um, operating system branch of iOS. But it, of course, shares uh, a lot uh, with iOS and, in fact, macOS. Um, this SwiftUI is probably the, to us here in this class, most interesting change because it introduced a new um, declarative par uh, paradigm of programming uh, that used one and the same language, Swift, for both the UI and the code that you're writing. And that's uh, what we're going to be taking a look at in a little bit more detail uh, later on today. Um, and then, of course, things have continued to evolve. For example, I thought it was really interesting to see Stage Manager uh, being introduced last year um, because it actually is sort of a, an in-between between the full window-based desktop environment that you get on, a, on, on like Mac OS or Windows or Linux um, and, a, and the split-screen arrangement that you know, the iPad has. So it starts feeling a bit like you know, the iPad is becoming a, a, a lightweight desktop uh, or laptop replacement for certain tasks. Um, what I'm not listing here is, since we wanted to stick with mobile first, is tvOS, uh, CarPlay, those kinds of things. Uh, we're going to also briefly talk about those in, in the class today. So let's go back to the moment when iOS was introduced. Uh, the roots of I iOS, or iPhone OS, uh, as it was called uh, at first, wa were Mac OS X. Right? Mac OS X at the time, today called Mac OS. So what happened was, here's Mac OS X at the time, around 2007, uh, when I, the iPhone was introduced, and the desktop was you know, structured like this, which you already know, right? We've talked about um, Mac OS X as a platform. So you've got your core OS, some core services, uh, on top of that, like low-level services in C mostly, the core OS is, is your kernel and your low-level system methods. Then you got a media layer that covers you know, drawing, um, audio, video, uh, and animation in C or, or Objective-C mostly. And then finally, you have a, a, a Cocoa layer on there uh, which is sort of your foundation, um, uh, as the foundation classes in there uh, and has the UI uh, in there as well as AppKit. Uh, this is all then wrapped in Objective-C uh, on Mac OS X. So now, uh, this is what it looks like on the phone. Um, so what you can see is most of these things actually stayed the same. The only thing that obviously had to change was the top layer, Cocoa Touch. Because Coco was the thing that contained all these widgets, uh, the buttons, scroll bars, you know, windows, etc., um, that had to be replaced and adjusted and, and redesigned for the use on mobile. Um, we don't have mouse input anymore. We have multi-touch input instead. We have no menu bar anymore. We have a single window window manager basically that goes full screen all the time. Um, so those were the big changes that had to happen on the mobile platform. That means that basically um, to move from AppKit to UIKit, AppKit being the, uh, the user interface toolkit for Mac OS X, right? um, to UIKit, which be, it was the original uh, user interface toolkit on, on iOS, um, views had to be redesigned, right? um, obviously, because we have less space, 
uh, we have uh, you know, bigger fingers basically. So you know, the finger is, is a bigger thing to tap with than a mouse on a desktop uh, screen. So we needed to redesign those buttons. Uh, we also um, had to reconsider event handling. Right? This is one of the interesting challenges uh, for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, okay, so one mouse click, we know how to deal with that now. Right? We've talked about this at length in all the systems we've seen so far. But what do you do when people touch with five fingers at a time? Like one finger comes down, second finger comes down, first finger moves, second finger lifts off again. Like what does all of this mean and how do we handle these events? So that needed a new redesign of the, um, of the whole event pipeline basically that goes into the operating system. Um, another thing that people often forget is that if you have a plain old uh, touch screen, you just lost hover. Right? And that is another thing that makes it actually surprisingly difficult to re-establish or recreate some user experiences on mobile that you know from the desktop, right? The simple tooltip, even if you went ahead and wanted to do tooltips because they'd only take up space the moment they pop up um, and then they go away again, so they're okay-ish even with smaller screens, but you can't do them, right? Because people either are hovering with their finger over the screen or they're touching. There is no in-between. Right? You don't know where the finger is until you actually get essentially a tap, which is like a click. That's one of the reasons why I was so excited about um, 3D touch, force touch, um, because it enables you to have this extra mode. Right? You, sort of, you could basically lightly touch and then force touch when you wanted to select something. That was, a, uh, was an avenue forward uh, that was possible. Um, today, we're actually seeing um, with some input devices, like the Apple Pencil, for example, that it actually does detect hover. Right? So hover is coming back into at least um, the, um, the iPad OS branch here um, and is available when you hover with your pencil over your iPad Pro or something, then you can actually, the app can re react to that and know where you are, show you like a cursor, for example, uh, before you actually select or tap something. Um, some other things uh, changed because you know modern more modern frameworks were useful. For example, uh, this link from from target to to action was no longer a one to one mapping, uh, but became a, a one to n mapping. Um, but on the other hand, there were also um, a couple things that uh, had to get you know that were limited. Uh, for example, originally the iPhone only had an RGB color space, whereas the Mac was always you know, took great pride in being able to process all kinds of different color space models. Um, that's the stuff that changed, had to change in the uh, user interface toolkit. But there are some other changes. For example, uh, Cocoa bindings, which you know, I had been raving about in Mac OS X, uh, weren't there because they were expensive right, to, to do computationally. There were no distributed objects, which, which isn't um, that grade of a deal, um, you know, in, in Objective-C on the Mac, you had the op you know, opportunity to actually create objects that were distributed across different uh, computers that could talk to other objects um, on a remote uh, computer without having to write network code. Basically, objects just figured it out themselves. Um, that wasn't there. Uh, and this is one that I was talking about earlier today, um, no garbage collection, right? So that scared the pants off developers, right? When they were like, oh my god, I need to manage my memory again? how do I do this again and what, what is it that I have to do? Because uh, memory management is surprisingly tricky. Right? And it's very easy to forget about something you allocated, some data you need for some computation and then you know, just leave it there and leave the routine. Next time you come back, you put some more data into memory and you know, before you know it, you have a memory leak. Uh, and that eats up memory quickly, especially on a mobile platform. Right? Wouldn't be so bad if you did manual memory management and you messed up occasionally on a desktop because you got plenty of resources. Um, but on a mobile device, you know, your memory is gone quite quickly. Um, so uh, something interesting here happened as an aside. Uh, Mac OS X had actually introduced, in 2007, had actually introduced something like garbage collection for a brief moment. Um, to avoid this manual, you know, having to count your own reference to an object and figuring out when you had no longer had a reference to an object, when the last person needing an object in memory was giving it up, basically then deallocating it. So Mac OS X had garbage collection for a little while, uh, iOS didn't, and then ARC came around, um, automated reference counting, which is a uh, 
I guess, the best of both worlds, which means you don't have to do manual man management, but you also don't have the overhead of garbage collection. Which, if you've done any Java programming, you know that garbage collection, when you're writing a high performance piece of code, will always kick in at the most inopportune moment, right? It will come in right when you are trying to render a fluid animation. It will like, oh, I'm going to do some garbage collection. And then the computer starts stuttering. Uh, and it's also a, um, a model that I think is, is in a way, it's, uh, has been on its way, on its way out. So ARC, um, automated reference counting, was what replaced this with in, in 2010 on both platforms, iOS and macOS, actually, uh, which Swift also uses, uses today. So anyway, uh, the, the lesson to learn here on this little aside on memory management is um, memory management can come back to haunt you anytime. Right? New platform, new um, device class comes out, uh, I don't know, smart shirt buttons or something. All of a sudden, you are heavily resource constrained. You're going to be back to doing it manually because that is the most efficient way of doing it if you know what you're doing. Um, and of course, there were other things, right? Um, quite simply, a laptop display doesn't rotate, right? Whereas the phone and the tablet do, right? So, you know, people had to, uh, the, you know, the, the UI toolkit developers and the Windows system developers had to think about what that means um, and, and how to use that. For example, there was an interesting user interface guideline that I thought was really, uh, was really kind of clever, which said um, your app should never use the rotation of the phone or tablet as a custom sort of input, right? It shouldn't be like, I don't know, you see your game screen when you hold it up, and when you turn it 90 degrees, you see your configuration screen or something. You're not, you were discouraged from doing that. Why? Because Apple said, it's, it should be up to the user whether they want to work in landscape or portrait. And of course, you adjust the view that is there. You use the space available. Um, but they should be able to pick that anytime they want to. You know, maybe you're lying in bed and you're looking at it sideways, and it actually si sits upright even though you're looking at it. For, so there's all kinds of weird situations that um, if you follow that rule that Apple put out, uh, will actually um, help users you know, to, to use it the way they want to. All right. So um, touch input, how do we handle touch input? You know how we do this on, on, on the desktop. Um, and so touch actually was handled uh, since the very first version of, of iOS, iPhone OS 1. Um, there was one way of doing that, which was sort of the lower level way of doing it. Um, there were functions to detect when a touch started, called touches began. Uh, there were functions when a touch point moved touch is moved, uh, when a touch was ended, um, or when it was canceled. Could anybody think of what the difference between ending a touch and canceling a touch is? I'll give you a hint. The canceling is not something that the user is doing. It's not triggered by the user doing something. Imagine you're drawing a line in a little, you know, finger painting app. And as you're drawing the line, your mom calls you. Yeah, yeah. or do you have any? Great. When you hit the home button, let's say you're, you're touching with one finger and you're drawing and you hit the home button. Right? Home button will take precedence. It will put your app into the background. That touch, you never lift it up, right? Not for the app at least, but it was canceled. Or if you know a phone ca call comes in and pops up and, and brings the phone UI to the front. So those kinds of situations. Um, to show how tricky it is when you think about it, what you need to, what you need to distinguish. So uh, this gave you a, th this little routine, for example, here. This is a very simple way of, of implementing a touches began routine. Um, you can kind of see what it does. It basically takes the first touch that it finds in the list of touches and prints out that location right, on, the, on the console. Um, so that would be a very simple uh, way. It would be ignoring any multi-touch. Right? It would just look at the fin first finger uh, that was touched down. Uh, and this would typically, you know, this method touches begin would typically be part of a view. That's why we can refer to self here in this point. Um, um, Apple realized, however, that, that you know, a lot of developers were not keen on, develop, you know, on implementing their own touch recognizers for like recognizing, let's say, a flick, an upwards flick or something like this. So um, in order to promote consistency so that everybody would use the same flick recognizer, so that a flick would work the same across all apps, um, they provided um, recognizers in iOS 3. So 
Uh, here you can see an, a use of that, for example, to recognize a pinch gesture, right? The two finger uh, pinch moving uh, in and out in, in this way. Uh, and in order to do that, you need, uh, you know, you, you had predefined recognizers, for example, for pinch, for panning, uh, for long presses, um, those kinds of things. Uh, you could, you, know, you were encouraged to use those when, they, when you could, but you could also implement your own custom recognizers if you had something really weird, like, I don't know, a, a three-finger circular swipe or something, uh, then you could do that. What does life as an app um, uh, look like? Uh, that's also quite different from the desktop, right? I mean, if you've ever looked for the, you know, the, the quit button or the quit menu function on, an, on a mobile app, um, you look in vain, right? It's not there. It's not meant to be um, ended. So the only thing that happens to it is, is it's relegated to the background. At that moment, it's supposed to save everything that it needs to save. And then if memory runs short, then it might get kicked off and, and might get deleted. And hopefully, um, deleted in the sense that the running instance gets, uh, gets deleted from memory, uh, uh, from the cache. And then it has to restore itself the next time it's launched. Or it could just sit there in the cached frozen version and you know, spring back to life when it's brought back to the foreground. Uh, so this is also reflected in the uh, in delegate methods. We know the delegate pattern, right? Um, which means that at any important moment, you can hook in a function that will do something specific that you want to do at that particular moment, right? So for example, if an app isn't running uh, and it's then moved to the foreground, it could be inactive or or active. It's going to be inactive for a uh, for a short moment. It's the transitional state while an app is launching, for example. Um, which means it's basically is already running in the foreground, it's already executing code, but it's not receiving events yet. Right? So it's usually a very short moment. Um, and then, uh, then, it turns, uh, then it turns active. Uh, whereas we have, oops, um, we have the, let me close this, there we go. Uh, whereas we have the, uh, um, uh, the background situation, when, the, when an app is moved to the background, uh, then it will uh, basically, uh, it can still be executing code, but um, often with certain limitations, especially on iOS. Um, and most apps enter the background uh, briefly only and then get suspended, right? And then basically gets frozen in. Uh, but if you are an app that says, oh, I'm going to get, I'm getting moved to the background. I need to do these things to clean up before I'm suspended, just in case I get, you know, killed later on. Uh, then uh, you get a chance to, to do a couple more things, like clean up work. Um, suspended means you're in memory, but you don't execute any code. And with a low memory condition, uh, you may get purged uh, from memory by the system. And uh, that's why you know, the, uh, the delegate pattern is used in iOS, so that you can basically observe these state changes and react to them um, uh, and, and do the uh, appropriate things. When iOS first came out, um, we had Objective-C as the language, which was taken over from macOS. Um, we had um, Interface Builder with its you know, uh, typical design patterns and, and typical tools to build applications. Um, and lots of things carried over from, from macOS as well. So uh, a typical iOS app um, in those days would look like this. You would have uh, your Swift code, of course, you know, um, or originally Objective-C code. You would have your user interface specified in Interface Builder uh, with you know, storyboards, et cetera, with screens being linked together in an XIB file, which was this you know, XML-ish uh, notation that uh, um, it is stored in. You would have uh, your assets, like you know, any icons and, and graphics that you might need for example, or sounds. And then you have this plist file, uh, which specifies how your app works, right? It says, like, um, you, the name of the app, the version number, any shortcuts, any supported file types, et cetera. Also, entitlements, like, what app APIs is this app going to be using? Are you an app that wants access to the user's location, for example? Right? That would also be in that um, plist file. Or are you using specific iCloud APIs? Or, or are you accessing the shared keychain um, uh, containing passwords, stuff like this? Um, so this is, by the way, this split into these four things is also uh, you know, known to you already from 
uh, UWP, right? The uh, Universal Windows Platform uh, works in a very similar way in, in this like four split of what's available there. All Android also works in a similar way. Right? So you're seeing a pattern here. Uh, this, di this division is fairly, fairly common. We'll see a slight change to how this works when we get to Swift UI in iOS, because in Swift UI, uh, you are no longer specifying your interface in a separate language uh, and, and tool. You are actually specifying it as part of uh, you know, using the same language, using Swift as a language. This is probably the key thing, um, apart from the declarative approach to programming, that is interesting in, in Swift specifically. Now, uh, if you have um, mobile devices, all of a sudden we are we need to think about a lot more different form factors than before, right? Before you had okay laptop screens and, and desktop screens of different sizes, but eh, they were all you know landscape. They were never you would never design for portrait screens usually, and uh, you know you basically you know, run the same GUI, just give the user the user would just have more space in the workspace. Uh, but you were never below like a minimum size that made you having to reconsider your UI layout fundamentally. Now that's different here again with mobile, right? Um, how do you create an interface that works well on, you know, a portrait phone, a landscape phone, uh, a portrait tablet, a landscape tablet? Um, that is actually tricky, right? Um, you can't work with pixel coordinates because you know those will break the next time a different. Um, device class or even orientation comes around. So you need to work with um, a format of describing the layout that actually you know, can adapt to these changes. And auto layout uh, was the solution that um, um, Apple introduced uh, already in Mac OS. And what it added to it in iOS were these different device classes. So Mac OS has auto layout. We've seen it, um, but um, iOS adopted it and added this idea of device classes and uh, so-called trait variations. Um, the devices you're seeing here is an, is an iPhone. This is an iPhone Max um, and, and an iPad mini. Um, and uh, the concept introduced here is, is similar to the, the uh, so-called breakpoints in, in XAML or, or how you define layout breakpoints in, in CSS. Um, but there are only two possible cl size classes, compact or regular. So Apple decided this um, dimension here, the horizontal dimension of these two devices, even though this is a bigger phone than this one, uh, is, called, is called compact. Whereas with the iPad mini, this begins to be called regular. In the other direction, all these three devices are regular, of course. Right? Um, if you were uh, to turn them, however, uh, this changes. Right? So if you turn on all these three devices, you now have um, regular on the large phone. This is still considered compact on a small iPhone. Um, and, and these, of course, are regular. And in the other direction, we've got compact and regular again. Um, so especially interesting, I think, here is, and maybe unexpected, is that a small iPhone was still considered compact even when you turn it uh, sideways, because the screen isn't quite uh, getting big enough to uh, be considered, you know, according to Apple's uh, classification, a regular width. And these. These variations, if you, you can basically, your app doesn't need to say, if I'm on an iPhone 5 and it's being held in portrait mode, or if I'm on an iPhone uh, 14 Pro and it's being held in landscape mode or something, you just say, what's my, uh, am I regular or compact in vertical? Am I regular or compact in horizontal? And that then decides your layout, basically. So um, since we. We know that uh, Apple basically said, um, you know, when, when it first had to create iOS, it basically took the uh, structure from, um, uh, from Mac OS and carried it over, right? The Cocoa uh, package, considering, of course, you know, foundation and AppKit and core data as its, as its model to uh, work with uh, persistent data. Um, you know, there was just, you could say, a small architectural change, right? Moving to, uh, uh, towards uh, Cocoa Touch. But it still meant that you know um, basically your view and your controller were no longer uh, the same, right? Um, usually that uh, you know might sound good, right? So you could say, okay, I need to you know basically move to Cocoa Touch. Now I have UI Kit, 
uh, and you know, foundation core data kind of um, can stay largely the same. But can we do better? Can we maybe, uh, I mean, traditionally you would say, if I'm moving to a new platform, I expect to only be able to reuse the model data anyway, right? I don't expect to reuse my view and my controller, right? That's the idea of MVC. New um, device, you know, new platform, you have to rewrite your controllers, you have to rewrite your views, your model stays the same. But can we do better? That's the question, right? Because, you know, re-implementing views, re-implementing controllers is a lot of work. Um, and that's what SwiftUI is doing, right? SwiftUI is saying, huh, we have an idea. Uh, we could actually uh, maybe, you know, not just reuse uh, this model and then say, um, you know, your views and controllers, you have to redo in UIKit, uh, but we can actually maybe go ahead and let you also reuse your view, um, your view parts and controller parts uh, without having to re-implement them for every class. That's the idea of SwiftUI, making that a little easier. So this is the world before SwiftUI. Um, and um, it was acceptable, but it meant that you were basically doing a lot of re-implementation to make your apps that had been running on a desktop work on mobile. Now, don't get me wrong. You usually can't take a desktop app and just run it on mobile anyway. Imagine you're Adobe, you got Photoshop, and now the iPhone comes out and everybody's like, yay, we're just gonna put Photoshop on the iPhone, it's gonna be awesome, right? Uh, the whole iPhone screen will be just toolbars and, you know, uh, and palettes and there's no space to actually work. And it doesn't make sense, right? Obviously, uh, it's not designed as that. So you, you know, all these apps had to be reconsidered and reconceptualized and you had to look for what kind of functions do we actually want to take over which functions make sense on this mobile platform with this short attention span, no precise input, you know, because fingers aren't as good to do fine drawings as you know, a mouse or a, or a graphics tablet, for example. Um, what can we use? And are there maybe new functions that the desktop app never had because it didn't make sense, but that we would now want to add? Like, I don't know, sharing your drawings by tapping two phones together or something, right? And people wouldn't crash their laptops against each other, right? That wasn't really a good setting. But on the mobile device, you know, this becomes interesting. So um, expect to redo your app anyway, significantly. But it would be nice if at least we didn't have to, you know, do all this transfer of, oh, this was the um, desktop button, and now I need a mobile a button on mobile, and that's going to look different, and I need to use completely different toolkits, completely different calls, uh, and, and do it all again. So SwiftUI is removing um, that uh, need to a certain degree by letting you write code that in principle will actually run as a UI adapting to the, uh, each, each device class on all the platforms that Apple offers. Um, let's take a quick break here before we dive into SwiftUI, get some air in here, and then we'll start taking a look at that um, new paradigm. SwiftUI. This is going to be fun. Um, this is a new way of writing apps for iOS, and you kind of almost get for free the fact that your apps can also then run on Mac, on iPads, um, even on watches, um, possibly on Apple TV, on the new AR headset that was just announced. Uh, so SwiftUI is the way forward for Apple um, because it basically does something very interesting in terms of how you define your user interface. Uh, what we've seen so far was largely an approach where we were fairly specific what components we wanted, where, in which relation, etc. cetera. And um, we're gonna move away from that, uh, especially in the way that we describe how the user interface is linked to your model data. In the classic approach, this was always, you know, even if you think about how UIKit works or AppKit works on, on the Mac, um, or all these other toolkits we've seen for, it was largely the idea that you would, um, you know, you could write your interface in code and then you would specify, oh, and if that button gets pressed, then I want to call this function, et cetera, et cetera. So very imperative, basically, imperative paradigm uh, for defining your UI. And now we're moving to a more declarative approach. So we're more like saying, this is what I would like to, the interface to look like, and this is the link between the UI what the, you know, what the views are supposed to represent is the following data. So you basically tell SwiftUI in a way that this view 
uh, should be the view for this kind of data, and then everything else is kind of taken care of. It's a bit like you know the, the cocoa bindings on steroids, right? The, this link between model data and, and your view data uh, being pushed to the extreme, so you, you don't actually have to um, specify, oh, you know, make sure that whenever this button changes or this, this value changes in my model, this data gets updated. No, that's actually now taken care of um, automatically when you may, when, once you've established those links. Um, so I think SwiftUI is an example for at least two or three common trends. The first trend is this move towards declarative programming, and you know, the React uh, framework is, is the same, in the same spirit, if you've, if you've worked with that. Um, that's a move I've, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing across um, all, the, all the platforms, more, more or less. Uh, and the second one is this cross-device design, so trying to be able to really build code that will work on a multiple, on, on many different devices, but in a smart way, not just saying, like, you know, remember we talked about cross-platform tools in the beginning, I said, yeah, here's this, you know, juice toolkit that will just create a window on your iPad, which is a complete break of how the iPad app should look, right? Um, this is trying to do it in a smart way so that it knows what apps are supposed to look like, how they're supposed to feel on each of these uh, size classes, these device classes, and then creates an appropriate UI for that. And sometimes, you know, reduces the UI or breaks it up into multiple screens if it doesn't fit on that form factor that you're targeting. Here's an example. Um, when you when you take a look at um, you know this this app here, this is an uh, uh, an app to configure the the toast that you're making or that you're ordering. Right, avocado toast are, is currently being being made, um, and the app is running on uh, on macOS. It's running on an iPhone and it's running on an Apple Watch. And this is the same app with the same Swift UI code uh, that where you, all you do is in, you know, Xcode, you switch your target. You say like, I would like this to be built for the Mac or for an iPhone, et cetera. Um, and notice how Swift UI actually then goes ahead and uses different widgets and also changes the layout based on which platform you're targeting. Now when I say platform here, I mean device class, right? Uh, Swift UI only works on, on Apple's uh, device classes. You can't uh, build a Swift UI app and, and run it on, on a Windows PC, for example. Um, it's not a cross-platform toolkit uh, in, in that sense. But we can see that, for example, this, um, you know, this, this, this uh, uh, thing here on the iPhone that was a, a way to select your bread, here becomes this, okay, bread is selected, uh, the bread is selected as wheat, and it has a tiny little right arrow, so I know I can click on, tap on that, and change it to something else. If I were to tap on that, a separate screen would pop up, right? Let me select something, or maybe um, <coughs> you know, a little picker um, screen would, subscreen would appear, I would pick something else, and then I would get back to this. Uh, that's what these arrows always indicate, right? It's a drill down. On the Mac, uh, it doesn't move to a separate uh, complete view, right? It pops up in place, and will just drop down here and let me select something else. Similarly for the, for the spread, um, and you can see the um, avocado, for example, here has only two options, sliced or, mush, uh, or mashed, right? So this on the iPhone becomes, a, again, a drill down thing that I need to tap onto, end up in a different view, make my choice, and then come back here. Whereas on the Mac, because we have more space and we know the concept of radio buttons, uh, it can be done right in this user interface. Um, including salt is is here, uh, you know, shown as one of those famous uh, toggle switches on iOS. Uh, here it's a checkbox, right? Similarly for the uh, red pepper one. Uh, also notice if you want to, you can specify slightly different wording on your different apps too. It's a possibility, but you don't have to. Right? It's just if you think uh, the wording should be different um, on a different platform. Um, the quantity is something that we can't quite see here, but it's one of those minus plus, you know, tap pickers where you can set a number, whereas here it's one of those things where you click with your mouse to increase or decrease it. Uh, and the order button, of course, becomes one of those famous featureless um, colored uh, buttons on iOS, whereas here it's, it's one of the typical desktop buttons. And even the watch has an interface, right? Here we can see um, that it actually has reduced things. So for some of the things, and this is something the app developer can specify, is not actually being brought into the uh, interface on the Apple Watch, right? Because you say, 
those kinds of selections I don't want to be available if somebody's trying to use the Apple Watch for it. Um, and it creates the interface um, automatically here for this. So um, this is an interesting way to, um, to see um, that you can basically define your interface once if you do it in the declarative style and then deploy on multiple device classes. So um, SwiftUI is designed for Swift, so, so where UIKit came around when Objective-C was still the language of choice, right? So it was, UIKit was really built like AppKit with Objective-C in mind. Uh, and the language and uh, the, uh, the toolkit were, uh, were quite related. And this changed, right, when you look at how uh, SwiftUI actually is designed for Swift as, as the language. Um, it's one framework across Apple's device classes um, that makes the code. Interestingly, once you actually build a SwiftUI app for a device, um, it actually does create native widgets, right? So it does use the native, um, for example, um, you know, buttons, etc., on a Mac or on, on an iPhone or on a, uh, on a watch. Um, the biggest difference here uh, to the earlier toolkits is this declarative nature. So you declare the UI, you link it to your model code uh, using a com uh, framework called combine that is also declarative. SwiftUI then derives the appropriate widgets to display and the layout of these widgets for each device class separately that you are targeting. Um, and that makes for extremely compact code, right? Uh, so your code uh, for standard UIs becomes very, very clean. Um, it also means that you don't need to worry about a lot of features anymore, um, like dark mode, for example. Right? Dark mode gets introduced, SwiftUI gets updated to include dark mode capability across all the devices that, are, that support it, uh, and your app code doesn't change at all. All of a sudden, it's just a UI that will also support dark mode, so you don't have to really worry about it as long as you use this declarative approach. However, there are also some drawbacks uh, to this approach. It means, of course, you've, you guys have all used LaTeX, right? Um, yeah, okay. You know how LaTeX is great because it's also, you just tell it what you need and it figures out how to do it, right? You don't say, I want this image exactly here on this page with this size. You just say, here's an image and make it look okay. Um, and SwiftUI is a bit like that, right? You tell it, these are the interface elements, the interface needs that I have in my, uh, in my UI, uh, and you figure out you know, how to do that. But it means that if you really want to fine tune and, and, and tweak things in the detail, that's tougher with SwiftUI, right? Because you do, SwiftUI doesn't give you quite that same reach into the details of the user interface. Now that's a net, not a big deal, because you can actually mix SwiftUI interfaces with UIKit interfaces freely. You can, so one app can contain parts written in UIKit, other parts in SwiftUI, uh, and, and that's fine. That's in, actually intended by Apple to enable people to develop to slowly adapt to the framework and, and pick it up uh, piece by piece. So oftentimes apps will actually say, oh, we've got this new uh, feature that we're adding. Uh, we're gonna implement the user interface for that new feature, I don't know, some new social sharing feature, we're going to implement that in SwiftUI, those views, and we're going to put those in there, but the rest of the app stays in UIKit, and then over time, gradually, you, you uh, modernize and, and renovate more of your, your app. The other thing that I found myself actually quite a brain teaser, and that I'm also seeing you know, among our students, um, that is a, is a big mental sw switch, is to rethink how you write apps. Because you are probably mostly wired to write code in an imperative you know, mindset, right? You say like, okay, if I want this to happen, I need to do these, 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 these things. That's what we get trained for as computer scientists. And now you have to kind of go back and, and maybe remember your original like, you know, computer science classes where people said, oh, remember there's the functional programming paradigm and the logical programming, right? These other things, there's Prolog and Lisp and all these kind of other approaches to programming. Um, that don't specify things down in a one, two, three fashion, but actually more like describe something and then let the system figure it out. So in a very loose connection, you could say when in Prolog you said, I want these statements all to be true, and then Prolog goes through and figures it out what the solution is, and you don't know how it does it. Uh, that's also you being very declarative about what you want and not writing down imperatively every step that leads to that result. And this is kind of the thinking 
pattern that you need to adapt a little in Swift UI. So oftentimes you will be wondering like, huh, the user interface is like this right now. Now uh, this data has, you know, th this thing has happened, some data has changed. I want to tell the UI to now change to this new way. And that's the w w wrong way to think, right? You have to think, wait, my views are always representing the state of my model data, right? My views always represent the state of some data. What's the link that I need to establish so that when that data changes, the view gets notified and automatically updates itself? That's the way to think about this. And that's a little tricky. Um, one of the things that you will, uh, you may wonder is like, how does SwiftUI do this? So it actually has a couple interesting approaches. The first thing is, uh, SwiftUI actually uses one and the same language for the user interface and the code. Um, this, is, this is not possible with classic languages like you know, Java or something, but Swift is being a fairly modern language like Kotlin, for example, um, Swift has a couple language features that enable it to become a domain-specific language. So Swift can be tweaked quite a lot as on the language level. It supports quite a lot of features that let you write things that almost don't look like code anymore. They really start looking more like a hierarchical document, if, you know, like, like an XML document, if, I guess, if, if I, I want to describe it. And that's possible with things like Clojure being a very prominent feature in Swift uh, that gets a lot of support. And, and I think the next slide is going to show you an example, and you'll get what I mean. Uh, what this ends up doing is um, you basically describe your user interface in a file that looks a bit like you know, motifs, user interface design language, or these other you know, like hierarchical descriptions that we've seen. Um, you know, uh, Qt, for example, used a similar approach right, with this like, XML layout. Um, but you are still writing Swift code. But it's very compact. Um, and the difference here that is new and unique to SwiftUI that I haven't seen anywhere else is that what you are writing is the actual source code. It's not a declarative document that gets parsed and turned into source code. It is, a, it is the actual source code. Which makes for a unique link, because all of a sudden, you can have a graphical editor, and you can have a source code editor, and they are basically working on the exact same file. Right? The second thing that is um, unique is, you know how, I guess, if, if you come from most platforms, you are used to uh, widgets being uh, classes, right? A button, what's a button in, in terms of programming? Usually it's a, there's a class, right, called button. And if you need a particular kind of button, you will subclass from that gener generic button class and maybe create a, I don't know, um, a push button or, or some kind of other uh, button that can display an icon, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whereas you may also be used to, you know, traditionally storing data in, in structs, in, in, in like, you know, simple simple variables, et cetera. And you have to almost like turn this on its head with SwiftUI. Because uh, SwiftUI, in SwiftUI, these views, uh, the things that you see in the interface are not objects, they're not classes, they're not derived from classes, they're actually structs. You know structs, right? You just have a bunch of um, variables that you bundle together. Um, but What's different between structs and, and classes is, is that uh, classes have inheritance, right? So you've got deep hierarchy, hierarchies of subclassing usually. Uh, for example, in, in, in Swing we saw that, you know, that, that hierarchy of widget classes that exists, uh, and that doesn't exist in, uh, in SwiftUI. In SwiftUI, views are structs. They can still have methods attached. That's the new thing, right? So Swift supports you defining a struct that has a couple member variables and then also has a method. So it almost looks like you're defining a class, um, but you're not. It's, it's a struct that is copied by value that gets thrown away, that is very lightweight, that is recreated on demand. And the big difference uh, in terms of classes versus structs is, of course, classes do support subclassing, views don't, um, uh, structs don't. So how do you then create a struct that is a button? Not by subclassing from the button class, but actually by adhering to the button 
protocol, because structs can adhere to protocol. So you end up with a much flatter hierarchy that just says if you want a struct of a particular type, you basically make sure that it adheres to that protocol. And that means then that it needs to su uh, supply certain member variables, certain uh, member functions, and that's, that's all it needs. Um, also, of course, objects, we all know that objects end up you know, somewhere um, in memory, right? Get allocated there as objects, and you know, three or four different uh, pointers can point to the same object and share data that way. Structs are value types, so they basically get put on the stack, uh, they are local, they get destroyed again, you pass them by value, so if you pass them to somebody else, they will get a copy, they won't get a reference to an object in memory. Um, so it's a, it's a very different way of thinking about what's uh, happening with your data. Uh, this becomes clearer, I think, when you see some code. Um, closures, uh, which you know as lambda functions from, from your theory classes, uh, let these views, these, these structs, uh, contain executable subreviews. For example, this is one of the ways that closures are being used. The enclosures are basically functions without a name, right? Just a bunch of code that I can pass around as a chunk of something I want to give, give to someone, like a parameter, for example. Uh, and that's what we do uh, with closures in order to pass, um, for example, into a view some subviews that are supposed to be children of that view. As I said, Views are a function of their state. That's like almost the mantra of writing declarative uh, user interface code, like in Swift UI. Um, views are a function of their state, not a result of a sequence of events that you have coded. Another thing that uh, Swift UI does, and it, it's possible because of some language features and some features of the IDE, is that it actually enables something called a live preview in Xcode, Xcode being the development environment of macOS and iOS. Um, what that means is traditionally you would have a graphical editor build your UI, do the wiring up to your code in whatever way, maybe by dragging and dropping into your code or something like this. Um, even in UIKit, that would be how you work, right? And then at some point, you know, UI doesn't really work, right? It's just a bunch of screens. And then you hit compile, and then you know everything gets slurped into a binary and gets run in a simulator or on an actual device if you're do doing it for uh, if you have a phone attached, um, and then you can test it out. Um, and that's a fairly lengthy process, as I'm sure you all know. So what you can do in Xcode is because we're using Swift as a language that can dynamically replace parts of an executable, it has this ability of um, basically reconfiguring an executable that as it is running. Um, is that we can have a live preview. So you basically have your left-hand side is your code, your right-hand side is your current preview of what your app is gonna look like, and it's your graphical editor for your UI, but it's live. So you can actually just hit run and it, it immediately is doing the things that it's supposed to be doing. Much faster than building a complete um, app from scratch and installing it into a simulator or on a device. Um, so this, this means that your UI design system and the code are very much linked together. It reminded me a bit of, um, uh, of Morphic. Right? Um, in Smalltalk, Squeak, um, we have uh, uh, the ability to um, you know, have basically in, change the interface while the app is running. Remember, you can, like in Morphic, you, in, in Squeak, you can do that kind of thing in Smalltalk. Um, and this is something that uh, almost it, here it feels like you're doing that, right? Because these live previews are um, are so fast and give you so quick access to the um, to your application and let you edit the interface so um, so immediately. Um, so maybe we should just take a take a look at this. Um, I think we can actually uh, go through this. What, what's going on here? Uh, what you see here is Xcode running um, and just opening up with you know, the simplest possible program you can write in Swift UI. So let's go through this. Uh, this. This shows not just Swift UI in use in a simple Hello World program, but it also shows how Xcode and its live preview work. So on the left hand side, uh, we've currently selected uh, the content view Swift file here, which is your UI file right, that contains. Um, uh, your, your user interface that you designed. The other Swift file that's there actually launches this 
Um, you know, so the Swift UI app Swift file is something you don't need to touch usually. It just launches this content view. Uh, and the assets folder, of course, contains um, your app icons, et cetera. Right? So we're importing Swift UI, obviously. We're starting by that. And then, as you can see, content view is a struct, right? There's no, it's not a, it's not a class. We're not instantiating an object of a class. We're just defining a uh, struct called content view. And we say that it adheres to the view protocol. This is the way that you know, replaces subclassing, basically, here with these structs. Um, what does it mean to adhere to a view protocol? Anything that wants to be part of the user interface, that wants to be a view, needs to adhere to the view protocol. Uh, it's kind of like you know, similar to the base class in, in most of your user interface toolkits that we've seen before. Um, what that means technically is that all you need to do to be a view is you must have a, a, a property called body. And that property needs to be not a normal member variable. It needs to be a computed property. Um, and computed property means that its value is not stored and then forgotten, but it actually gets recomputed every time you ask for it. And this is one of the mechanisms that makes sure that views can always update themselves and respect, uh, reflect the value of some data, right? The, reflect the state of your model. Um, what does body do? Body actually also returns a view. Um, it, it returns some view. This is a, a syntactic detail because um, at this point of writing this, the compiler doesn't know yet what kind of view we're returning. Is it a text field? Is it a dialogue? Is it a whole you know, complex UI? Uh, so we need to put that some view there to um, be able to work uh, with this um, uncertainty of type. Um, anything you want to display on view needs to be a view, needs to adhere to the view protocol. So if we were talking about classes and subclassing, we would say view is the parent class of all, um, all the things that can be shown on screen. But we're not in, in, in class land anymore. Um, so instead, we're, what we're doing here is what's called protocol-oriented programming. Right? Uh, we're, uh, we cannot subclass structs, but we can adhere to protocol. Uh, what you see then is body is what, where you actually go ahead and specify your UI. Here we have um, a text view, right? and that is created by um, you know, just saying, I want um, a text struct. Again, this is a view. Right? Text is a view because it has to be, because body needs to return a view as a result. Um, and this text actually contains, um, you know, gets passed in a parameter, hello world. Now notice what's going on here. Body is a computed property. And as you can imagine, a computed property needs to have some code that says how to compute it. Right? So that's what we're doing here with this. Uh, uh, that's why this is in, 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 in curly braces. Right? That's, the, that's the piece of code that gets executed. So this is not a, uh, you know, it, it, although it looks like it, it's not like in, a, in an XML document. Uh, but it is actually code that gets executed. But the writing really reminds us of this hierarchical um, XML-like look of defining a user interface. So this is sort of showing this, this syntax that you know, um, SwiftUI supports that makes things almost look like um, you're declaring your user interface. Uh, this stuff below here is something that you know, in, in everyday uh, programming, you can ignore it. But I want to explain what it does, because it, it shows how the live preview works. What you're doing down here is that you are basically um, telling Xcode uh, what to show if the user is using this live preview feature. Where in this case, we're saying, well, the only thing we need to be a preview provider, again, we're adhering to a protocol, we need to provide a variable called previews. And that variable is also a view. And that needs to be returned. And in this case, we're saying, well, just show the content view. Right? Just show the interface. Uh, you could imagine that uh, you might actually want to do something different here. Let's say you're writing, um, I don't know, a photos app. Um, and in order to, for your live preview here, to have some photo to work with to see how your user interface looks, you're going to put a sample photo into your assets and show that in the simulator, in, in, this, in this live preview. But your actual shipped app doesn't need that photo, right? Because it will work with the photos that the user takes. So in this case, you would have here some slightly different code that said, well, create a content view, but pass in, for example, some kind of parameter that says, use this photo to show. Right? So that's where uh, how, you, how you customize your um, preview code in order to 
uh, represented. So now if we wanted to actually start building a, uh, a hierarchy of widgets, uh, that's easy enough. All we need to do is uh, put two text objects um, beneath each other. And remember, these are, you know, Swift doesn't have semicolons at the end, so these are two lines of code, right? This is actually code that gets executed, uh, but it looks like we're specifying um, a, a hierarchical uh, document structure. And in order to put these uh, both on the screen, uh, we need to tell SwiftUI how to lay them out, right? Are they supposed to be next to each other, beneath each other, on top of each other? Uh, and in this case, we're saying put them into a v-stack, which is a vertical stack, which just arranges its children one beneath the other. So um, what you can see here is that this is the declarative nature of specifying the UA, UI, but we can still do it in Swift, right? Um, what's also interesting is that this can be done by typing this text, as we did in this example here, but you can also... Um, you know, click on your source code, open a context menu, and say, for example, embed this view into a vStack. Right? That's a graphical way of, of extending your code, which would also inter insert this uh, kind of like a, like a snippet. Or you could go into your UI preview, which is actually you know, something you can also edit. You can change, go in here and change stuff over here. Um, and for example, add a new uh, view here or embed something into a stack. Uh, or change the, what, what it says on that button. Or, what we're not seeing here because of the space uh, of the screen, is we have an inspector, which you could also go in and change these things. So there are great options uh, of you know, how you want to edit your code. It really depends on what you know, tickles your fancy at any time and what's most convenient. If you have some code snippet you're copying out of you know, Stack Overflow that goes right into your source code and your UI you know, gets created that way. If you are a graphical person and you're more used to designing your UI visually or you want to move something around on the screen and you don't want to m mess with the, the textual representation because you're nervous about messing up the code, you can do it in the graphical view and the code will update live as well. Um, so in order to show you this, I'm going to do a brief switch over um, to Xcode. Uh, so you see that this is nothing magical that's going on here. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to launch Xcode down here, um, and it pops up and says, you know, create a new project. I'm going to create a new project. And as you can see, you can create apps for iOS, macOS, watchOS, tvOS, driver kit, whatever. Um, we're going to go with a simple iOS app for now to just keep things uh, really straightforward. But as I, as I ind indicated, if you later decide, oh, I want to use this also on macOS, um, you could actually use the exact same code and just deploy it to another target. But we're going to stick with that. Um, let's call it uh, Hello uh, Swift UI. Okay. Um, and I'm using, I'm not using Storyboard, which is the old way of doing things with UI kit and, uh, and segways and storyboards, etc., cetera, and, and, and XIV files. I'm using Swift UI as the way to design my UI. This is the, the new thing, right? And the language is Swift, of course, because SwiftUI doesn't support Objective-C. If I were to go with Storyboard, I could also pick Objective-C, but we're not. All right. I can also, at this point, turn on using core data uh, in order to also have a way to directly um, have persistent model data. But again, that gets more complicated than what I want to show uh, today. So we're gonna just going to stick with the simplest possible things here. So let me put that uh, file in here. I'm not going to create a Git for that. And here we are. I'm going to uh, maybe actually zoom in on this or make it a little bit bigger. There we go. Okay. So now you can see pretty much everything that's going on here. Uh, and so what do we have? We have um, our um, a program here that's, that's being created for us. Uh, we're currently looking at the content view as I, as I explained. Oh, this is too small, right? I'm going to change the... Uh, Font size here, sorry. Um, I'm just going to go presentation large, dark. Yeah, that's a bit much. Presentation dark. How is that readable? Good? Okay. Is, is that better? Yep, okay. Stick with that. Good. So uh, we've got our um, 
um, content views to have open here, and here's what, what you were seeing before. Uh, the sample that, that Apple creates for us here is basically a vertical stack that includes a couple things, an image and a text. Right? Um, these two uh, parts are also visible here on the right-hand side. Uh, we can already see the image that's being loaded and, and we can see the text. A uh, couple things to point out here. First of all, uh, as I said, I can edit this. Right? I can go in here and change this. Uh, and as you can see, as I'm changing this, the live preview actually changes too, right? So I'm seeing my user interface updating here um, uh, while, it is, while it is running. Uh, I could also go in and uh, tap on an object here in the, in the preview. I need to, for that, I need to stop the uh, live rendering, I think. Um, and I can go in and select individual elements. When I, whenever I switch over to other elements, it will actually um, highlight these objects in the editor and let me go into the inspector, for example, and change things here as well. For now, I want to keep the live preview running uh, so that you can see that whenever I do something in the code, it actually updates. Um, the, what's interesting is that we've removed a lot of the sort of syntactic complexity of, of creating interfaces, right? So a text uh, label is simply called a text, an image is simply called an image. So these things are fairly straightforward because they are now cross-device cross, cross uh, class, right? We're not designing just for iPhone or, or, or tablet or, or Mac OS. Another thing that um, I think is interesting to see here is that the, uh, the way that this code is written allows us to specify changes to an object by adding these so-called modifiers. Uh, this code here, this dot image scale large, is essentially attached like a method call right, to this image object. Remember, structs can have methods. right? So image is a struct that implements the uh, method image scale, which is called here. Um, and by putting it into the next line and, and, and indenting it like this, it looks a little bit like we're specifying a couple declarative parameters. But we're really calling code with this. Right? Um, so if I went in here, and and uh, were to to add something to this, I could you know I could I could say foreground color um, I don't know dot red um, how it work and we have red text right so that works uh, just like this um, and you know the the syntactic um, convention is to put these things on a line by itself so that we can see these things um, as modifiers as they are called being being defined also. Um, this dot red is just a shorthand for basically saying color um, dot red um, so that we know, uh, again, which struct actually provides this, this kind of setting. Dot padding is an interesting one, too. Um, if, I, um, <clears throat> if I put that, for example, between the image and the text, if I remove that here um, and put that between the image and the text, then we will see that these two get separated a little more because now image actually has padding around itself. What kind of padding? we can actually see here on the right-hand side in the inspector, it's actually got padding on all four, uh, four sides by the default, right? If I remove this padding, if I were to take this away, and delete that, then the padding is no longer active, as you can see here, and it is inherited. So it gets its pairing from, from its parent, right? The VStack, whatever that setting of that VStack is. So, this is a really convenient way of specifying things. Um, if I wanted to add um, objects here, I could do that by um, you know, adding another, I don't know, um, another uh, piece of text here, and then that would get added, get added to, the, uh, to the object. I could uh, right click on this thing um, and, uh, sorry, uh, come on. Yeah. I can, I can uh, right click on this and open up the, uh, the context menu to insert this into more structures like the VStack. Um, but I can also go in and uh, stop the, uh, the live view, uh, which is currently running, right? So currently the canvas is, uh, is active. And if I stop the, um, uh, the live preview, then I end up basically with something that uh, lets me actually edit the, uh, the file also in the screen view itself. The 
key thing to take away from Swift UI, I think, is that we have declarative programming and that we are using one and the same language for the user interface and for our code. Um, that's, an, that's a new thing that we haven't seen in, that, in this format um, before. Uh, for now, I'm going to stop this miniature demo here um, and actually move on to explain a couple more things about SwiftUI. Let me see if I can recreate my earlier arrangement. Okay, so um, we've seen the VStack in use. Um, there's H stacks and Z stacks that you know basically arrange things side by side or on top of each other. Uh, very, very obvious. Um, I haven't shown you yet how you actually change state, right? You've just seen how you how we lay out objects on the uh, on the interface, um, and how that works is you know here's an example of a button. So a button is created simply by you know saying uh, button, and then what we pass into it is the text that goes onto it. Like for example, click me, and and in, in uh, parentheses here we have the variable counter being inserted literally into into the uh, into the text string, um, counter being um, a variable that is part of our content view here. Uh, and uh, next up comes some interesting uh, notation. As you can see, after this button here comes a curly brace. And that's kind of confusing, right? What's that doing? This is actually trailing closure syntax. So let me explain it in two steps. The first thing is um, closure being just a piece of code, right? So one of the parameters that a button takes as a struct, uh, when you uh, when you uh, create a struct of the type button, is a piece of code, a closure, right? A nameless piece of code, a function without a header. Um, so you could put that in there as one of the uh, parameters in the uh, in the round parentheses behind the button, but that would look kind of ugly. Um, so what trailing closures do is they say, if a, a struct has only this one piece of code, only one kind of argument, one parameter that is actual code, um, that is a closure, then you can move that to the end behind the round parentheses and just put it in curly braces behind that. That's a swift syntactic sugar, if you like. Uh, that sounds very innocuous, but it actually is extremely powerful because what it does is that I say that I want a button and uh, I say some of the one of the parameters is this text that goes onto the button that gets passed and normally and the piece of code that needs to go with the button that says what to do when it gets clicked is actually passed in as a trailing closure syntax uh, after that. So that's why the per these round uh, these these um, curly braces are behind uh, this ra these round parentheses here, where you would think, well, wait a minute, here I'm done by with you know calling um, you know creating this button object or or this button struct here. Uh, what's this curly brace doing? So that's basically technically goes into the parameter list and it's just the last parameter um, that is a closure and that's why we can move it out of these parentheses. And as we can see, what the button is supposed to be doing when it gets clicked is to increase counter by one. Um, and sure enough, if you run this, that's exactly what it's doing. Uh, maybe one, a couple of things more to explain here. Um, as you can see, uh, normally, we uh, structs are um, our value types, and Swift structs are fixed. Normally, you cannot actually change their properties after they've been created, which may be very weird to think about. Right? So you create a struct, you put values into its member variables, that's it. Right? You normally don't uh, change it. That's why we have to um, create a variable with this at state property here, uh, which is called a property wrapper that you need to store this counter of this view. Uh, of this view struct when it gets destroyed and rebuilt. Normally, it would all go away, right? So every time um, this view is being recreated, um, all the data gets thrown out. Thrown out. Uh, with the state property wrapper, we avoid that. Um, it's made private here because state is really only meant to be used by, uh, for data that only a single view really needs, right? You know, stuff like this counter here that's only relevant uh, inside this uh, single view. Um, <coughs> Uh, so here, what we also did is we ran this uh, code and clicked three times. And as you can see, the uh, live preview has updated to show uh, the number three. So this is uh, running code in here. Now you might be saying, OK, so that's cool. I now know that I can um, you know, influence stuff when, uh, when the button gets clicked. Um, I know how to read uh, you know, these state variables and, and put them into a UI. 
But what about the other direction? What if I uh, want to, for example, have a text field in which I enter a name, uh, and I want that you know, text field, when the user presses enter on it, actually to play back the, you know, to, to put the value back into a variable um, that I can then show in, uh, in a label beneath that. That's what this example here is doing. So here, uh, we're doing a couple things slightly different. First of all, we're using a new container widget that's called form. Form lays out things on the iPhone in this typical, like, like the settings app, basically, right? in this typical look um, of, of things very compact, right? So we don't have the, um, the, the VStack anymore that looks a little bit homebrew. Uh, this looks a little bit more like a, a, a normal uh, iOS screen. Um, next up, uh, we have a dollar sign that's new, right? So here it says text dollar name. This dollar means for, um, for Swift and Swift UI that this is actually a two-way binding, meaning that um, the text field view is now bound to this name property that we've introduced, right? We've got uh, the name property here as a, as a state private variable uh, being empty initially. So it's now also written back when, uh, when it's changed in the UI. Initially, uh, the app shows the, uh, the name prompt in gray because the string is still empty and the text field knows that this first parameter, which is the prompt to show, can be shown as long as nothing has been entered as a, as a text here. Um, and then when you basically uh, enter something here, um, then you know, the prompt goes away, the text is being entered into the text field, and as the text field value changes, uh, the text actually, because of the two-way binding, is updated also and finds out that, oh, my name uh, variable has changed, I need to rebuild myself. And this is what I meant with views being, you know, views are very lightweight. They're structs. They are easy to create, destroy, and recreate very quick, uh, unlike objects um, uh, that you would hold in somewhere in memory. So uh, because these things are fairly easy to create, actually every time uh, the label on this, uh, on this text here changes, uh, that text here gets completely thrown away, uh, and a new one gets created in its stead. Sounds expensive, but actually isn't, because structs are very lightweight data structures. The text view, however, itself does not require a dollar here. Why? Because it's not writing anything back into the variable, right? It just needs the value of that variable uh, to update itself whenever it changes. Uh, and again, doing this, uh, you know, typing something in and, and so on, uh, I can do all of this without ever actually hitting compile and run. I never built an app. I just was using live previews here. Um, I don't need to actually you know, run this app and install it in the simulator on a virtual iPhone or even on a, uh, on a, uh, on a real iPhone. All right. Um, I mentioned modifiers in my sample, uh, in, my, in, my short, in my short demo already. Um, modifiers don't just apply changes to a view, uh, but instead, remember what we said about views. Views are cheap to destroy and recreate. So every time you apply a modifier to a view, what happens internally is that the old view you know, gets basically thrown out and a new one gets created that has the modifier applied in its stead. Um, so this code, in principle, creates a label text, then immediately throws that away again and re recreates it with the red color being set. Now there are optimization steps behind the scenes that make sure that this doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't take uh, too long or doesn't always get executed. But this is how conceptually you need to think about it. Uh, that's also um, possible recursively. So here I have a VStack with two texts inside it. And then I apply this modifier to the VStack. Notice how we're using in the VStack, we're using the trailing closure syntax, right? The VStack has no parameters except for one, right? that one parameter is a closure. So I can write it in trailing closure syntax. So that's why I can say vstack curly braces and then text text. Now that should be confusing you know, as code, but it, you know, that's exactly what we're doing here. So we're basically writing code that says create a vstack and the parameter that goes into it is a piece of code. And that piece of code is written in closing, closing uh, uh, trailing closure syntax um, as being two text um, objects beneath each other. And once that has happened, once it has been executed, then the VStack returns a view, 
which I can then apply the foreground color um, modifier to, right? which then changes the um, text one and text two for both labels into the color. So that's, that's how you can apply these things recursively. Um, what you can also see, and this is why conceptually understanding how these things get, get applied is important, is that order matters. Right? So here we have a label that first gets some padding around it. So the label gets created with no padding. Then padding is applied. We have a new label that now has padding. The old one is thrown out. And then we apply to this new one the background color red. Right? So we get the whole background being filled out in red because the label at that point already had the padding. If, however, you create a label uh, you apply the background color red to it, you now have a, red, uh, you know, a, a label with red background, and then you apply padding, then the padding, which is still there, uh, but it doesn't get that new color, right? because um, the padding expands with invisible uh, space around the existing object. Okay, uh, so we now can see how modifiers work, how we can pass data, uh, between code and the UI in SwiftUI, how we specify hierarchical tree structures. Uh, let's take a look at a slightly larger example here, um, just to give you an idea. I'm not going to go into full detail on this. This is a, um, a, a bit of a, a, a sample demo um, that you can that just helps us to understand what's going on. So here we're looking at a, a piece of a larger um, example in which you can uh, store rooms with their uh, with their details and, and information about each room. Um, and how that works is basically, as you can see here, we have a content view as usual. We have uh, a list of rooms uh, that is of type room. We don't need to worry about how, how that looks exactly at this point. Uh, but what's interesting is to see how you get from one view to the next in SwiftUI. So the way you do that is you embed your list of rooms, which is a list object in, in SwiftUI. You embed that into a navigation link view. So that's why uh, when you click on any of these rooms, you can actually get to a detail view. We are not seeing um, the detail view uh, here. In fact, you know, that is somewhere else in the code called the detail view, and it would basically just list up all the things that you want to know about a room. But we link to that detail view here with a destination in this navigation link. Um, and in order to fill that navigation link with some content, uh, we have a trailing closure syntax that says, that each navigation link uh, should have an image inside it with a corner radius 8. That's the image over here. Um, and it should also then basically have a V stack of two things um, beneath that, which is, first of all, a text uh, that has the name of the room, observation deck, for example, and then another text of the capacity, like how many people fit into that room. And we have a couple modifiers applied to that text, like the, um, the font and the foreground color. Um, in the end, the list object, uh, or sorry, not list, but the list struct basically asks for a trailing closure syntax parameter that says what is each object, you know, what, what, what is each item in my list supposed to look like, right? So we're specifying we have a list. That list contains navigation links. These navigation links contain images and, and vstacks of text um, uh, and room and, uh, with, with the name and the capacity. And all that wraps up into creating this list. Uh, and then finally, we can give that navigation, uh, uh, um, this navigation link view um, a title by modifying its uh, navigation bar title into saying, I want text rooms up here to appear as the title of this uh, navigation screen. So what I think um, you notice is that this is not easy to read um, when, when you really want to understand what's going on. Right? If you really want to understand where's the code here, what are parameters, what are statements, uh, who, what gets passed where, et cetera, this is, takes a little decoding. Right? You need to think through, especially the trailing closure syntax. You can rewrite all this to look very familiar to you, right? but then it's going to be uglier, but you can read it you know, like a book uh, in, in the kind of style that you're used to. But if you adopt the trailing closure and things, and once you've, you've kind of, you know that you've understood what it means, then it's very elegant to specify user interfaces in this way because you're just writing down something that almost looks like a, like a DTD. All right. Um, 
So to wrap up uh, with this idea of declarative programming, um, you know, if you're in the Mensa, you are also you know, doing declarative ordering. Right? Don't, you don't care how they make you know, your chicken schnitzel with french fries. You just order one. right? And then you know, the return value is your chicken schnitzel with french fries. Right? Uh, you just describe the result you want. You don't care how it is being produced, how it's being built. You don't give them a recipe and, and what to do step by step. Right? Um, so similarly, if you ask for, you know, if you ask SwiftUI for a label containing the word schnitzel in a large green font that looks like that, uh, that's what you get back. Right? Um, in case you get any funny ideas, um, this doesn't always work in the Mensa, so don't don't try this one. One more thing I want to point out is uh, you're probably uh, very familiar with MVC, um, but here we're seeing a variant of MVC that's called MVVM. Uh, that's what SwiftUI is, is doing. It's not using the model view controller paradigm anymore because uh, that would mean a lot of writing controller and, and view classes. Uh, and instead, it goes for something called model view view model, which is maybe a little confusing. Uh, but what it means is basically just what you've already seen in the demos here, uh, which is that the view will always basically uh, be constructed based on the data that it represents. Right? So you might say um, the view is directly linked to the model. Well, and it almost is, but there are some things that sometimes need to happen in order to explain to the view how it needs to represent the data. And that goes into what's called the view model. Um, and this is in structure quite similar to the Windows um, uh, presentation foundation framework that you've um, um, that we already talked about briefly when we looked at uh, how Windows evolved back in 2006. So um, it's similar in principle, but the new thing here is that we're using one and the same language for these, these things. So a couple of pros and cons. I think uh, it's obvious that um, writing Swift UI code, um, I sat down in a cafe for a couple of weekends um, I think in 2020 or so, with my wife, and she learned how to write apps in SwiftUI. She's not a computer scientist. Uh, now, she's smart, but she's not a computer scientist. And so this definitely lowers the threshold to code apps, right? because it actually gets fairly simple to build a basic UI and an application that does some things. Um, you're writing much less glue code. Uh, use one of the same language for the UI and the code. Uh, plus, this one UI description that you do can actually work across your watch, your phone, uh, a tablet and, and the Mac. So it's easy to deploy to multiple device classes. Um, you don't need to worry as much about user interface design guidelines on each device class. If you don't know exactly how to best represent you know, changing a value on the watch, just let SwiftUI take care of it. Right? It will use the right widgets for the right purposes, for the interaction purposes, on each device class. Um, also, if the UITK updates itself, for example, you know, dark mode gets introduced, um, again, you don't really have to worry about it too much, right? It is something that SwiftUI will take care of for you. So without doing anything, uh, you basically reap the rewards of innovations that are happening in the UITK. This is because you are one step away from the actual physical um, device-specific UI toolkit. SwiftUI does that intermediate translation for you. Um, plus, it's also the, the official way forward. So Apple has promised to support Objective-C and AppKit and UIKit for a few more years. Um, uh, and uh, you know, it has, so far, I think if you want non-standard uh, applications and uh, very specific solutions, there's a huge body, of course, of Stack Overflow answers to, uh, on, on UIKit and AppKit and so on. Um, but this is slowly changing, right? So as time goes on, uh, SwiftUI gets more and more exposure um, and gets used more and more frequently. And some new technologies like widgets, for example, um, you can only do with SwiftUI. So Apple has already started uh, introducing new things into the user interface where developers are forced to, to use the new frameworks. Um, some disadvantages. You need to rewire your brain. <laughs> you need to rethink how applications are written uh, if you're used to object-oriented imperative programming. You have less control over the exact look and feel because SwiftUI kind of lays it out for you latex style. Um, for non-standard GUIs, it's not 
that great, right? If you want to do something very, you know, off the charts that looks completely different from a standard GUI, uh, then SwiftUI is not going to give you as much support. You need to do much more tweaking then. Um, integrating um, old code, like, you know, AppKit, UIKit frameworks, for example, is not uh, very elegant, right? It's, it's like, you know, writing Carbon apps back in 2001 when Mac OS X came out and you still had Mac OS 9 code. Um, there's not a super elegant way of doing this. Um, and uh, the user interface toolkit, uh, so Swift UI, is still evolving, right? For example, you probably heard, you know, WWDC was last week or so when, you know, the uh, AR headset got announced, right? Um, and with that announcement also became new things in Swift UI. So some things are still changing, much less so than in the first couple of years. It's now been out for four years, so it's beginning to settle down. But you need to continue learning, and you need to sometimes continue updating your code to work with the latest versions of Swift UI. If you want to learn more about this, you can, of course, go to the iOS class, uh, where we um, do both UI kit and Swift UI as, uh, as topics, and you learn how to develop using these frameworks. We're gradually there also swift moving towards putting more emphasis on Swift UI being the new way of doing things, and gradually ramping down the exposure to, to UI kit, the, the previous way of doing things. Um, but if you go out and want a job today writing apps and you know, maybe with an existing code base, it's a good idea to know how UI kit works. Um, for a very simple introduction, um, uh, that uh, you can watch that original video that introduces SwiftUI really, really nicely uh, by the original developers uh, from, from Apple. Um, if you want a hands-on hands free tutorial, the one that I uh, used to teach my wife SwiftUI, uh, you know, go to Paul Hudson's website, 100 Days of SwiftUI. It's a great uh, third-party resource that, you know, I don't know when this person sleeps, but he constantly updates his stuff. Uh, for the latest uh, changes in, in Swift and Swift UI, and it's very, very prolific and, and very well documented. Um, well, and then there's Apple's home de uh, developer homepage for Swift UI that you can go to to, you know, basically get to the sources the, straight from the horse's mouth, so to say. Uh, wrapping that up, this part, uh, I think with with looking at Swift UI highlights a few trends that I think are important to to keep in mind. First of all, the trend from imperative to declarative programming um, that we haven't only seen in SwiftUI, but also uh, in the way, for example, you specify things um, using uh, the latest Windows toolkits or um, you know, React, for example. Um, we see a move also from this event-based programming in which you had callbacks that react to things to more of a pub publish-subscribe mechanism that links you know, your code, and, um, your model code, and your user interface. Um, I'm sensing that, that mobile and desktop paradigms are beginning to partly re-merge in a way as tablets get more powerful. They pick up more and more features that you would traditionally expect on the desktop. Stage Manager on, on iPadOS is a good example of that. Um, Multi-device workspaces are becoming a thing. Um, today, you can basically start typing a text on your iPhone and then just continue doing that on your Mac and move it off to your iPad. Um, and those things are, of course, a major usability and, and user interface nightmare to get right. Um, but as people have more and more devices around them, uh, it becomes a necessity. Um, Apple's approach to how mobile apps, mobile devices work is very app-centric, right? Everything is an app. Android, as we will see in a moment, also has apps, but very differently. Uh, and one way in which Apple is counteracting that is that it introduced widgets. Widgets are sort of a, a different way at getting access to the functionality of an app, right? You might have an app that, I don't know, does detailed sports results tracking, but if you want to just see the current result of your favorite team, you can do, you know, and develop, can write a widget that pulls out just that information and puts it on the home screen, lock screen, et cetera. So interweaving components from different apps is something that is becoming uh, a thing as these uh, platforms are maturing. Then, of course, there's other form factors, you know, CarPlay, Vision OS, et cetera, that take a lot of um, effort. Uh, there are multi-user interfaces, like, you know, SharePlay, for example, lets you watch videos together. Um, 
machine learning is being done with all the things. Right? A lot of the more recent technologies are using machine learning heavily, uh, for example, uh, for the AR features um, that, uh, that Apple offers. Um, privacy is being uh, pushed quite a bit, I think. You know, um, for example, with the recent introduction of um, pass keys, which are re replacement for, for passwords that we've seen on the, the iOS platform. That's an interesting trend. Um, uh, also, um, I think the, uh, the feature Apple calls it focus, but there are similar things on other platforms, uh, shows that people are getting overwhelmed by the information that their mobile devices are throwing at them all the time. And uh, focus is one example of a way to introduce modes of operation, of using your device in different modes when you're at home versus at work or when you're sleeping at night. And of course, energy efficiency continues to be a topic. Right? Um, that seems to never go away with mobile devices because all the improvements in battery technology immediately get eaten up um, by new features. And OK, so um, iOS, done. Let's look at Android. The history of Android is actually largely parallel to what ha was happening in iOS. Um, Android started, interestingly, the roots of Android started with devices that still had buttons. Uh, but then um, I guess Google still got the message. And when they released their first Android device, or the first Android device uh, came out, which was actually the HTC Dream, so not by Google, um, that actually was um, something that already had a touch screen. Although there was still, as you can see, um, a keyboard beneath that. But this thing didn't, didn't even have a, uh, a touch screen. Um, we, we are seeing then, you know, the, the Android tablet came out, uh, the Android market opened up a year after the, the iOS app store. Um, uh, you know, OK Google became available, um, which was basically uh, a little after Siri, but nowadays um, the voice, act, uh, voice assistants in Google have definitely outperformed what, what Apple has been able to provide. Um, and um, we're seeing similar things happening, right? Support for TVs and watches, for example, um, happened around 2014. Um, Android now runs most TVs, as I'm sure you know. Right? It's, it's hard to get a, uh, get a TV that doesn't run Android, actually. Um, fingerprint gestures, right? This, these are things that um, allow back of device interaction even, right? So we, uh, I thought this was a really interesting addition um, like you know, swipe gestures to see notifications on the back of the device, um, um, interesting things. Uh, and then, of course, fold foldable smartphones are a thing that um, um, the Android world is, is uh, far ahead of what Apple has been releasing so far. Um, and um, they existed before 2019, but they became mainstream that year with, with the Galaxy Fold. Um, and um, the design in... Uh, language of uh, Android is also changing. Um, uh, Material Design 3, also called Material U, is basically a way uh, to do late refinement, as we called it when we introduced this in, in this class earlier this year, um, which lets you basically customize your user interface theme based on your own uh, wallpaper, et cetera, et cetera. So, and app developers can actually use that to allow customization, even coloring your keyboard according to your own preferences. So there is a sort of tendency to provide more individualistic uh, looks and feels also on the Android side. Technically, what does the stack look like, the overall Android system architecture? Well, like iOS and macOS, we're running on a Unix kernel, right? Here it is Linux. Um, and uh, you know this takes care of shared memory, uh, USB, Wi-Fi, all these kind of fundamental driver levels. Um, there is an open source version of Android, but 70% of the installed base in Android actually is using Google's closed source version of, of the, the platform. Um, there's a hardware abstraction layer, which is still um, in C, which you know, offers you things like audio, uh, Bluetooth, camera, uh, sensor access, etc. cetera. Um, then there's native li libraries um, that are also usually written in C, C++. Um, here, um, Android uh, deviates from, from iOS in interesting ways. It, it, it immediately uh, goes to SQLite as a, as a local database rather than uh, the core data framework that we know from, uh, from iOS. And next to that, we have the Android runtime, the ART, uh, which is, you know, Android you know, used to start with, uh, with a, a Java, a version of Java, let's put it that way, that was running in uh, in the classic Java virtual machine, you know, just in time, 
um, interpretation or just-in-time compilation version. And nowadays, actually, um, apps get pre-compiled on installation right? so, um, to, to squeeze a bit more performance out of this. Um, we have, uh, on top of that, then, um, the Android framework, which offers you things like activities, content providers, et cetera. We'll talk about those in a minute. Um, and the access is through Java or now uh, Kotlin, which is a, um, a variant of, of Java, but uh, you know, cleaned up syntactically, but uh, you know, very, uh, plays very well with the Java runtime and Java virtual machine. Um, applications on top of that, some of them bundle with the OS, just like with iOS. Um, and um, compiled Kotlin apps, by the way, are actually uh, still executing essentially on the same uh, fundamental uh, uh, machine as, as Java apps did. Uh, there is a, a, a trend towards native compilation to say, like, I'm going to compile for this particular uh, technology, but that's currently still uh, in, in beta. Applications are quite different in Android from what uh, we know from iOS. Um, the idea is that uh, we don't have a single entry point, like in an iOS app, you'd launch it, and there's a main routine, and that's where things start. Uh, in, uh, on Android, you share elements of these applications. So all um, the four different types of components that we see down here of apps on Android can be possible entry points for the system or the user. So Android is not app-centric. It's actually more, you could say, activity-centric. Um, so you can call on apps and their functionalities in other ways than just launching them. Um, Activities, to make it simple, are screens. Services are background uh, things like music playback. Uh, broadcast receivers fetch system events, and uh, content providers give you uh, a way to share data consistently across apps. Um, so for example, let's say you have an address, address book app, uh, and your app starts the activity um, to capture a photo um, in uh, using the camera. That activity would actually run in a process that belongs to the camera app. Um, and then you know, transitions back into the address book app. So on iOS instead, you would implement a mini camera view uh, inside the iOS application. It would run inside the iOS process. That's not the case on Android. Android, you can imagine applications consisting of modules, if you like, of these types that can actually be used by other applications um, if you know, the security uh, regulations allow that. So uh, let's look at these uh, briefly. An activity is a single screen of your application's UI. So you can think of it as a view, uh, basically. Um, it can actually contain a tree of views, just as we know it uh, from other platforms. Um, and it would define the menus that are available. Um, an activity can start and stop services, which we'll see in a minute. Uh, and it can call other activities via so-called intents, which we'll also talk about uh, next. So, uh, nothing too surprising here. Think of acti activity as one laid out screen of your app. Um, intents then are, uh, allow you to call other activities, no matter whether they're part of your own app or whether they are part of actually an external app. Um, their explicit intents are those things that uh, are opening in another activity in the same app, whereas implicit intents are your app requesting some kind of abstract service and you don't know who is going to answer to that. You don't know the callee. You don't know the receiver. Um, the receivers use intent filters to basically expose what kind of th things they can offer to other applications. You know, what kind of things can I do for you? Um, so in the animation here, what you can see is we go from the Maps app to the phone app because somebody wants to start a call action from inside the, uh, the Map application. But the Map app doesn't know the phone app specifically. It just says, ooh. My user, you know, I need to call somebody, basically. Right? The application, the Maps application needs the feature to call somebody. And the phone app happens to have posted that in its intent filters that it can do that. Uh, and so it can respond to that. So that's you know, how you would then un end up with that phone uh, UI. Um, and then you know, it would take you back later then to the, to the Map application. Um, so. The next thing we need to understand are these broadcast receivers. So implicit intents are, uh, broadcasts are examples of implicit intents, like for time zone changes, device shutdown, when basically just, you know, uh, anybody can re register for these things uh, and say, I want to do something when that happens, right? So 
um, you could write uh, um, you could re uh, you know write something that reacts to a, a broadcast of the device shutdown and then does maybe I don't know some updating of some online files somewhere else before the shutdown happens. Um, if you uh, use a dynamic broadcast receiver, then uh, that means that your app can react to changes during runtime. And that's actually something that uh, you could also do uh, using a notification center on iOS. Um, but uh, the second option here, that does not exist on, on iOS. And there's, uh, uh, the reason for that is different safety models. Uh, on iOS, you cannot write an application as a developer, have that installed on the device, have it not run, and then launch when one of those notifications, the system-wide notifications, are being posted. It doesn't work for safety reasons. Could, you know, somebody could write a malicious app that basically the moment the system says, I've booted up, anybody want to do something, you could write an app that says, yeah, let's shut down, you know, or let's reboot. And then you know, the whole system would be locked down. Now, of course, Google, Play, Google Store, just like the Apple App Store, would probably filter that out. But Apple decided to put a stop on that on an even more fundamental level, so you cannot have uh, non-running apps respond to these kinds of broadcasts. But if an app is already running in the background, um, then you know, using Notification Center on iOS or using these dynamic broadcast receivers on, uh, on um, Android, you can respond to these things. I mentioned services before. Uh, services are long-running operations in the background that don't uh, provide a UI. For example, network transfer or playing back music on, on uh, the system performing some kind of file uh, I.O. Again, these exist in two flavors. Um, a normal service or an unbound service is kept alive even if the starting activity has finished. So uh, it could actually keep running. For example, a Dropbox client, right? You launch that and it will sync to the, uh, to the cloud anytime. Um, again, this kind of unbound service is actually uh, more liberal as a policy on Android uh, than it is on iOS. On iOS, it's very hard to get applications to be allowed to do something like do processing in the background. There are quite a few hoops you need to jump through. The idea on the Apple side, on the, on the iOS side, is to avoid the user ever being able to you know, install apps and configure their phone so that the battery gets drained quickly. In Android, a uh, little bit more responsibility, also freedom for the user, saying like, oh, you can install all these things if your battery dies quickly, your fault. Um, so uh, unbound services are not uh, available on, on iOS in comparison, but uh, they are available on Android. Bound services are more typical. You st start a service and then, um, you know, like an audio file player uh, that only runs while there is a UI to control it. Once you're done, it actually shuts down and gets, uh, gets destroyed. Uh, so that doesn't eat into your background um, uh, battery or, or other uh, processing resources. And then the thing we're left is, with is the content provider. The content provider uh, is basically a way to help an app manage a database uh, and manage access to that data that it stores. So let's say you wrote a, um, an application to uh, like a contact uh, database uh, application. It runs on an SQLite database. You, pro you write a content provider. And the content provider basically shields off the database um, and uh, provides access to the database for your own app but also possibly for others. So your own app might have access to that with like a GUI, cursors, widgets, search buttons, et cetera, uh, more functionality to make up a complete app that is you know, your context app. But it could also provide access to that database through the content provider to other apps that then um, can access this. This is different from, for example, how Apple handles core data. Because core data also provides a database and access to it in an object-oriented way but only to the app that owns the core data database. Right? It's not, um, not, con not shared with other applications. Manifests in Android um, are, uh, again, an example of a pattern that you've seen a lot. Uh, it's an XML file that defines um, sort of a black box view of an application, um, the icons, the requirements that it has, what kind of API level does it need for access, what kind of permissions does it need, does it need to place calls. Does it need to access you know, your photo library, et cetera? Um, and it also ex exposes what the app can do for others, right? Available activities and intent filters, so entry points that other people can, uh, other apps can use from this. This is like the info plist on iOS or the Windows XAML file, um, what the app is allowed to do and what it offers, basically. Right? Um, 
So you can see that um, you know, we're basically uh, using a similar approach here um, to other platforms that we've already talked about. I want to briefly touch on uh, things beyond uh, just mobile platforms. Um, and that one of them is uh, TVs, and the other one is uh, watches and cars. But these get increasingly shorter exposure. Um, for TVs, uh, as I already mentioned, Android is running most TVs these days, right? They uh, run apps, so they need a window system, right? Um, and um, there are some things that are, again, different uh, when you think about how to handle a TV uh, user interface. Um, imagine how you're sitting in front of your TV. You're sitting a couple meters away, right? So the UI is back there. Uh, you don't have a mouse or anything like that. You don't have touch input. Uh, you have a certain you know, a remote or something in your hand uh, that you might use to select things, but these are usually fairly simple. Um, and uh, the resolution of TVs for the distance that they're at uh, is OK, but in total, it's actually not that much. Right? So the, the interface on a TV actually needs to be simpler than what you show on a desktop. Right? Because you're farther away, uh, the pixel resolution isn't as high. Um, and uh, that means that you actually need to only show about as much as you might show on a large phone or a small, small tablet, maybe. And of course, you need to somehow find out how you connect your user uh, with, your, with your contact. Uh, with your content. So um, one thing is, of course, immersion. So since TVs are primarily used for entertainment, uh, you try to pull people in and engage them into something where you use edge-to-edge -edge, uh, views, fluid animations, captivating audio, uh, vibrant colors. Um, you try to go for a very clear, consistent layout, making the focus clear. That's one of the key challenges. Right? On, a, on a TV, there is some kind of cursor that highlights one element at a time, right? But you don't necessarily want to move a full screen pointer around. You rather want to highlight the things that you've selected. So it's almost like an invisible cursor that always selects the thing that it is over. Right? So more like a hover effect without a mouse pointer, if you want. Um, and uh, the movement across the space, since you often only have you know, like a cursor control on your remote, uh, has to be very consistent and predictable. You have to know how to get from a to B. How, how do I select you know, this icon over here? Input happens using those kinds of devices, right? Very, fairly simple ones, game controllers, remotes, uh, sometimes with a continuous input, but mostly discrete um, knobs and, and controls. And this means that we have to use a focus model. That's the fundamental interaction principle on a TV. You highlight always one element only. Uh, your focus moves in the direction that the user most expects. So, you know, um, principle of least surprise here. Um, and content can move in the opposite direction of the focus. That depends on whether you're doing one of those sliding effects where you're sliding through 15 videos, you're moving to the right, and your content slides to the left for that. Um, uh, and there's often uh, an interesting um, difference here when you, when you do this, it's like a Scrolling over content, it might move against your, your movement, whereas if you have full screen views, then the user feels like they are touching the object and moving it. So in that case, the gesture move and the content move actually are going in the same direction. Um, whatever it is, the focused item needs to be obvious, right? Um, so the focus model typically says, um, you know, take the UI, consider everything that the user can see at this point, start from the currently focused view, and find any other regions in the path of motion. Um, and the size of that search area is related to how big the currently focused view is. So in this example here, if the user moves towards the right, then the next thing to select would be this one over here, clearly, right? And then uh, that would get picked up. But um, if the uh, user, for example, moved uh, you know, left and right, up here, up and down here, everything is perfectly clear. But what about this object here? That is not in the path of these objects, right? So selecting that is something that your focus model needs to somehow offer, right? How do we, how do we get to there uh, by confusing the user the least? It's not easy. This might require overriding the default uh, way of navigating. Uh, you know, for example, that object with the red cross in it was something that wasn't in my standard path of navigation. So then I need to basically uh, 
tweak my navigation to say I can also get to this extra object down here. Um, and one there's two solutions to this, and I want to show you two examples. One is uh, uh, how the Xbox does it, and the other one is how tvOS does it. Um, if you uh, look at the Xbox, what it basically does, it, it, it statically defines the next successor. So it basically says where to go next for each element. Um, tvOS, on the other hand, uses dynamic focus guides that reflow the uh, navigation. They are more code, but are more dynamic. So on Xbox, uh, in this example, it would basically, semantically, you would want to, you know, to go from button two to three with one click, right? You would want to go one, two, and then up to three with one click. You don't want to go up and right again, because these four are a sequence, right? Um, so how do you do that? Um, on the Xbox, to, to override this would kind of look like this. It's fairly declarative. It's fairly obvious what's going on here. Uh, you're basically just saying, all right, I have um, um, a stack panel uh, oriented horizontally, then there is a binding uh, on, uh, on button three to, to move the focus right, and then we have a couple buttons here uh, with content one, content two. This thir the third button here is called button three, so we can refer to it over here. That's why we give it a name. We've seen that principle before in, uh, in the Windows examples. Um, and with this uh, linking, we now basically tell it that after one and two, the next thing we want to go to uh, would be button three. Right? So, and then comes, comes four, where the navigation is automatically derived. Um, on tvOS, you would instead implement a focus guide. Right? So let's say you've got this user interface here, um, and you want to move between shop now and more images directly. Um, you would actually have to do quite a bit of coding. It's not impossible. Uh, but it is a lot of stuff. This is just for the lower right guide. If you read through this, you will see that we're setting up lots of anchors that basically say, like, if this button is, is active and we move to the right, then we want this to happen as a result. So there's a lot of wiring up to, uh, being done. Um, we can think of focus guides in tvOS like um, invisible views, basically, that reflow and redefine the navigation that's happening. Uh, it's more dynamic than uh, the bindings that you saw in Xbox. Uh, you can change it even at runtime, since it's code, uh, but it is more code to, to write. Um, and interestingly, um, tvOS more, more recently has actually also moved to SwiftUI. So um, if you don't want to go into this de amount of detail, then uh, you will probably also end up just doing it in SwiftUI, which then takes care of these kinds of uh, cases for you. Just a few more, uh, really more observations um, on how much finesse has to go into UI to actually look OK. Um, this is just an example of these subtleties. This is the parallax effect. Um, what you will see in um, tvOS is when you have some object uh, selected, it gets elevated a little. It gets a little bigger than the others. It gets a little drop shadow. Uh, and if you then touch your remote just a little, it has this little you know, kind of joysticky, touchpad-y like thing on it, uh, it will actually move, it will sway, and the reflections will show this. Uh, there's an illumination being rendered so that you get a reflection effect, and after a while uh, of inactivity, it actually grows, and the other things get a little dimmer so that you can remember where your focus is when you come back to your TV. Um, and this is actually not just taking a flat piece of you know, image and rotating it, if you look really closely, you will actually see when I animate this, that these different layers, the, the, the mountains and the forests, are actually shifting uh, uh, with a proper 3D parallax effect. So it almost looks like you're looking at a 3D scene. Um, maybe you can see that here. Right, so you see the light playing, and you also see that there is a shifting happening between this back and front thing that looks like you're looking at a layered um, image that actually has some visual visual depth. All right, before you all get seasick, I'm going to move on. Uh, I just wanted to point out, this is, a, this is super subtle, right? You have to really pay attention to noticing this on, on your TV. But what it does, it, it gives you the feeling that you're interacting with a, an object that has some depth and some substance to it. And you know very well what you've currently selected. So next time you're playing with any TV interface, try to look at how does it tell me what's currently the focus object? How, what is it using? What kind of visual cues? How is the navigation being laid out? How does it know? Tell me how to get from A to B to C. Uh, 
All right, one slide each on cars and, and watches, or really just to, to touch on what's going on there. Uh, there are a couple technolo technically interesting things in, in car interaction. The first one is um, uh, maybe a political one. Uh, car manufacturers are, find this kind of like a mixed blessing and curse, right? Because just like the phone operators lost all, in, like the, the network operators like Vodafone, Telecom, et cetera, lost pretty much all influence on the UI experience with when the iPhone came out, uh, what you're giving up as a car manufacturer here is basically a core part of the user experience of driving in that car, because it just looks like an Apple device. Right? Um, and same thing with Android Auto, of course, right? Same, same story. Um, technically, uh, it's interesting that, that General Motors, for example, currently is playing a bit of a shy member and saying like, oh, we may not actually want to put CarPlay and, and Android Auto into future cars because we want to make our own money with, by selling subscriptions to our own added services in the car and not have people just plug in their iPhone and go. Um, technically interesting, I think, is that um, CarPlay evolved out of AirPlay. Um, um, a, one of our far, former uh, students here actually ended up working at Apple and ended up also, among other things, heading the, uh, the AirPlay and CarPlay teams. Um, and uh, this was an interesting evolve, uh, evolution um, because there are some really difficult challenges, right? You need to, uh, first of all, every car is different, of course. Every model looks different. You need to pay attention to a, a variety of different screen modalities. Some screens are tiny, some are big, some have touch screens, some have resistive touch still, some have capacitive, multi-capacitive now. Um, then there's divided attention, of course, I hope, right? Hopefully you're paying attention to the, to the road. Um, and, and this is, of course, you know, emphasized by safety regulations, right? And touchscreens are not the first thing that would come to my mind when I'm in a car, right? Because I can't feel the control without looking at it. Um, so it's a, it's a difficult thing to do well. Um, and uh, so I think we're actually seeing in, uh, this in evolving further. This was the you know, Apple's basically first shot at it, where you basically got an iPhone interface, an iPhone-like interface, reduced a bit, made even simpler than what's on a, on a smartphone, because they know that you're only glancing over there, so they can put even less content on it, even if it's the same physical size. It's farther away. You don't have time to look at it in detail. Uh, so it's, it's even more simplified than what you see on a smartphone. Really more like a big watch. I you could almost say. Um, and nowadays, uh, it's actually expanding to cover you know, all of this, like even the uh, speedometer area here, the center part of the car. If you see CarPlay uh, 2, I think it's called, the latest versions are trying to be all encompassing so that you can take, you know, Apple can take over the old UI in the car. And most manufacturers are playing along, um, but um, probably not just with, a, with happy thoughts. Um, it also is a prime example of consistency challenges, right? How do I, I if I if I put uh, an iPhone UI in the car? I mean, personally, I love this. Right? I know how my iPhone works, and any car I get into, I plug in my iPhone and I know how the car works, right? This is great. I know how to play back music and how to send messages and whatnot, uh, and how to navigate, for example. That's that's probably most important. But of course. Um, it's not consistent with the rest of the car, right? The rest of the car still has a UI, and, and Apple doesn't necessarily know what that looks like exactly. So keeping that consistent is actually a challenge. And then, of course, there's wearables like uh, uh, Apple Watch or all the other smartwatches that are flooding the market now. Uh, more restricted memory, even smaller screen sizes, massive power challenges, right? I mean, these things actually need to survive a day, right? I mean, they get charged every night, but they may need to make it through the day. Um, they are even more personal, even more intimate than a, than a smartphone. Right? This is something I wear. A lot of people wear it at night right, to track their sleep patterns and stuff like this. So, uh, a really uh, intimate device that needs very careful design. Haptic feedback, huge thing on, on on watches, much more so than on phones because you can feel it on your wrist exactly. Um, and it's interesting. The earliest versions of um, <laughs> of Apple Watch. Uh, actually almost worked like the earliest versions of CarPlay, which basically just streamed a screen out to the device from the phone. When you ran early watch apps, they weren't actually apps by themselves running on the phone. They were literally tethered to the device, to the iPhone, and the iPhone was pushing the content over and was receiving the, the input back. So 
Uh, that was the, the simplest way of doing it. Now, of course, you can write standalone uh, Apple Watch apps. Your iPhone doesn't even need to be there anymore. Um, but that wasn't the case in the first years. It has a completely you own user interface toolkit of, with its own designs for widgets. Um, support for the digital crown, which um, uh, if you've never done this, try it out if you get a chance. Uh, you, know, you can let everybody you know, twiddle the digital crown on your Apple Watch, maybe. Uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, haptic feeling because there is no mechanical uh, clicker or, or, or uh, ratchet in there, but it feels like there was. It's really well done. Uh, it's a big step up from the old vibration motors that we used to have in our phones that go right, This is a completely different story. Much faster, higher frequency haptic responses um, that allow for a quite, quite um, fine haptic feedback that uh, you can get. And this, this is basically um, where, the, where the whole um, market is, is going. Um, as I said, if you accept the standard interface that the uh, SwiftUI creates, you can deploy it to, to Apple Watches with something like SwiftUI. All right, with that, I'm going to wrap up. I think we've got two things. Uh, these limitations repeat themselves in history, so memory management, right? Uh, it could come back and, and haunt you. Uh, and what I'm also seeing is with these improvements in how IDEs are developing over time, uh, we're seeing the rise of the amateur programmer. I think writing apps, writing mobile apps, for example, has become so much simpler, not just because of SwiftUI, but also of the, because of things like Swift Playgrounds. It's an app you can install in your iPad, and you can write apps with lots of support from, from the tool, even more than what Xcode gives you. Um, not for complex backend server code, right? But for simple apps for personal use, niche hobbies, et cetera. And, and that's, that's also why we don't just teach you how to write Windows apps but we try, or, or, or iOS apps, but we try to uh, teach you the patterns in this class of, of these, how these UI to case and, and Windows systems are designed. So you can be part of those people who built the next great Windows system uh, and, and user interface tool. With that, we're done with the post test of user interfaces for today. Thanks a lot, and see you again next week. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.